Hello and welcome to the February 2021 meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society. Uh, an in-person meeting this month uh, at the Briars uh, is not possible due to the um, pandemic restrictions still being in place uh, and hopefully trying to avert a uh, third wave uh, of the uh, pandemic. Now the big news astronomy wise this uh, month has been the arrival of three very different spacecraft at uh, the red planet Mars. Uh, which is still visible in the uh, northeastern sky of an evening if uh, you wish to go out and uh, the clouds are kind to you. First to arrive on February the 9th was the United Arab Emirates uh, craft um, Al Amal which uh, translates as meaning hope which uh, inserted itself uh, into orbit uh, successfully and uh, is uh, circling uh, the planet and has sent back uh, some images uh, already. The second to arrive on the next day, on February the 10th, was a Chinese uh, craft, uh, Tianwen-1, which uh, translates, I believe, uh, to mean uh, questions to heaven. And that also successfully inserted itself uh, into orbit, uh, returned one black and white photo, uh, and I believe will stay up in orbit for a couple of months before sending a landing craft and rover down to the surface. Arriving uh, very, very shortly this week um, will actually be NASA's uh, Perseverance Mars rover that will go down to the surface early Friday morning our time at about uh, 6.15 in the morning. So if you wish to watch the live stream of that, the details were posted to the eScorpius um, email group some time ago. So please uh, refer back to them or if you can't uh, find it, just uh, send an email to uh, the uh, Astronomical Society and we'll uh, post you those uh, details uh, by email back. So all very exciting. So we'll begin very, very shortly with um, uh, about a two minute video showing some of the uh, shake, rattle and roll testing that uh, occurred of the Perseverance rover. And you'll notice the uh, the size of it relative to the people there. Indeed, even if you look at the picture on the first slide that was shown of the United Arab Emirates uh, craft, uh, you'll notice it is quite large compared to the person showing at the uh, bottom right hand side of that uh, particular image. So these crafts aren't the size of um, a small uh, radio controlled craft uh, that you might uh, buy as a toy from a uh, department store. But these are, are fully fledged uh, rovers that you could even put a person on. Uh, they're they're um, that uh, large and uh, bulky. So we'll uh, first of all show that and then uh, get into uh, today's meeting. <laughs>
Right, well, welcome back, and um, tonight, uh, first of all, uh, a welcome to any new members of the Society. It's, uh, we usually try these days to record the meetings of the Society for future reference, and for those members who, for one reason or another, can't make it along to the Briars uh, on the night uh, when they're usually held. Tonight, obviously, we can't at the Briars because we're all um, still in lockdown or restricted to five kilometres uh, radius uh, from home. Um, so if you are a new member of the Society, welcome, and uh, we hope to uh, meet up with you at some stage uh, in the future. Do please feel free to come along to any Society event whatsoever and um, uh, make yourself known at uh, one of the members' uh, viewing nights, particularly uh, when they're held on the Saturday evening, which is the Saturday held after the, um, the monthly meeting, uh, ordinarily. Uh, for uh, seasoned uh, members of the society who are yet to renew for 2021 uh, or take out a five-year membership if they're after saving some money, um, then uh, please uh, bear in mind that renewal is on the 1st of January, so um, you may not be a member very much uh, longer. Uh, Moving on, we'll uh, come to go through the events that have occurred for the Society in the uh, preceding month and also what's uh, coming up. Uh, main talk uh, today uh, will be a video actually featuring John Dobson, um, a very famous uh, amateur astronomer uh, who has the telescope known as the Dobsonian, named after him. And uh, this, uh, this video is all about um, how to build your own Dobsonian telescope and he goes through it in some detail showing how it can be done at home uh, for those who are uh, keen and maybe a little bit uh, handy at uh, building things. And uh, certainly it's not as hard as what uh, you might think at, uh, at first sight, but uh, nevertheless uh, daunting for someone who's never um, done it before. Uh, John Dobson actually passed away um, getting on for about six, seven years ago. So um, this uh, particular video, which dates back to about 1992, is uh, indeed one of his uh, legacy ones. And uh, hopefully you'll find it enjoyable to see how these uh, telescopes are uh, actually uh, made. Then that will be followed by uh, Mark Stevens giving uh, Sky for the month. And um, because we're not meeting, there's no tea break and no observing afterwards, so uh, we'll just go into some um, uh, particularly relevant uh, science videos. So one will be looking at how strong is the wind on Mars. Anyone who's uh, seen the uh, Hollywood movie called uh, Mars and, uh, and saw the impact on that of uh, a very large uh, dust storm on Mars uh, may be wondering, is that actually realistic? And indeed, uh, after you watch this uh, short video by uh, Cody Reader, um, you'll see that uh, very much uh, it, uh, it's not too realistic uh, at all. That'll then be followed by a video taken from Mark uh, Rober's uh, uh, YouTube channel um, on um, uh, creating a liquid bed based on uh, sand. And you'll see some of the very, very strange properties of uh, sand uh, when you start to shake it and you'll come to appreciate the uh, real danger of putting up high-rise buildings on um, foundations that aren't uh, anchored very, very firmly into bedrock and might just be sitting on a, um, a layer of sand or indeed even houses sitting on a layer of sand. Um, so earthquakes can be particularly dangerous um, as the New Zealanders certainly know uh, when you have um, buildings on, um, on very uh, unstable uh, surfaces. This will then be followed by um, a video by uh, Derek Muller of uh, the Veritasium YouTube uh, channel speaking all about the sun sneeze gene and anyone who has this gene will be uh, familiar with uh, the impacts where if you go from a dark room out into bright sunlight it can uh, cause you to uh, sneeze and he goes into uh, some of the details uh, of that. And uh, interestingly, it's referred the, the phenomena is referred to as our chew, and uh, there's a, a, a lovely acronym for what that stands for. Then uh, followed uh, by uh, Lance uh, Geiger of the History Channel, he's a historian, and uh, talking about uh, the Radium Girls, which uh, are those uh, women back in the 1900s who used to paint on the radium onto watch dials such that it would make them glow in the dark so that you could actually read the, um, 
time of a night time in the dark and uh, the, uh, the very sad circumstances that uh, came from their exposure to uh, radium and some of the things that were learned for uh, future generations leading to uh, workplace uh, safety. Then we look at uh, what is a black hole and does it have hair? Um, yes, indeed, given by um, a physics girl, uh, Diana uh, Cowan of uh, the Physics Girl uh, channel and a uh, very uh, instructive um, uh, YouTube video uh, as usual. This will then be followed by um, our uh, closure and tonight's uh, closure will show a video of the Perseverance rover coming in as, uh, as predicted and uh, animated by NASA and it will have a uh, backing track uh, known as uh, EPIC, which is uh, royalty-free care of uh, bensound.com. And uh, for your um, uh, edification before we close uh, the meeting. So recent events uh, of the Society have been on the 22nd of January. We had uh, David Rolfe uh, give his uh, solar system talk at the public stargazing night at the Briars and we were um, booked again to uh, our COVID capacity and uh, so in total there were uh, 60 people on site, uh, though obviously uh, we're limited to 50 and some organisers uh, indoors at any one time. And it was uh, fairly good uh, conditions with about on average 10% uh, cloud uh, in the sky at the time. Then the very next night we had a members night and uh, barbecue at the Briars. And that was combined on the very same night, but a little later in the evening with a Hallam Scout viewing night, uh, just uh, about five minutes away from the Briars, down at uh, the base of uh, Mount Martha at uh, the Joseph Harris uh, Scout Camp, where there were uh, 50 scouts of uh, various ages there. It was only about 5% cloud cover and fairly wispy during most of the evening, so uh, very good uh, talk. And, um, and the viewing of uh, the night uh, afterwards. I, I gave the talk and handed around the meteorites and uh, promptly afterwards uh, then washed the meteorite down by uh, immersion in soapy water. So I have a very clean meteorite now for handing around at the, uh, the next meeting. In fact, I'd say it's the uh, one and only time it's ever been washed in, in its entire history uh, since uh, landing on the earth, I would venture as well. So uh, quite a first and uh, we will do that each time it's uh, handed out and, uh, and touched as well for as long as uh, COVID is around. Next event was on the 3rd of February, uh, slightly delayed uh, committee meeting and um, that was uh, conducted by uh, Zoom. And the uh, primary things talked about were uh, a bit of a uh, look at um, the uh, trainee speakers and uh, any feedback they uh, had on their experience looking at uh, the Telescope Learning Day and the uh, risks uh, for that from uh, COVID and also the concert that is underway at the Briars on the same day as well, which is a mass, mass event of many, many thousands of people. So obviously presents a bit of a COVID issue in its uh, own right. Uh, we then looked at um, uh, uh, possible uh, grant submissions as well. Uh, looked at renewing the COVID plan to bring it up to date and uh, what we can do about uh, the toilets to uh, try and pest proof them and also a potential visit by the Astronomical Society of um, Geelong as well who'd uh, approached us about it. Following that uh, by a couple of days later on the, the Friday there was another public uh, stargazing night uh, at the Briars which is the fe uh, February night. We had 48 there. Uh, on average throughout the evening it was about 50% uh, clouded. It started off really really cloudy but uh, cleared a little bit later. And the talk was given by um, one of our wonderful new speakers, Catherine McCoy, who uh, delivered it with uh, Trevor Hand uh, at the front as well. And uh, everyone uh, really enjoyed that and uh, had a great time. Now coming up uh, soon, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, we have um, Percy the uh, Rover landing on Mars this coming Friday morning, Australian time at uh, 6 15 in the morning um, best to uh, watch that stream if you're going to watch it uh, a little early uh, just in case you have any difficulties uh, uh, attaching to it and also um, uh, check out to make sure that uh, the times haven't changed since uh, i uh, first put out the uh, the announcement about that a couple of weeks ago 
uh, because of course last minute changes are always possible. Um, so on Saturday at, the, at this stage, um, the Telescope Learning Day is still going ahead at the Bryce for those who have booked. It's only for those uh, who have booked uh, because of COVID reasons. However, there is quite a good chance that it will be rescheduled to a later date for various reasons, not least of which being the current lockdown that we're under at the moment may be extended or it may be uh, very, very uncertain um, during uh, that, uh, that Saturday. Uh, an announcement of that will go out to everyone who's actually booked for that event. Um, should should it uh, not go ahead, or indeed indeed uh, to confirm if it has, still uh, going to go ahead. Next committee meeting is 24th of February, which uh, may or may not be at the Briars. It may indeed be uh, by Zoom again, depending on the COVID situation. And on the 26th of February, we're currently scheduled in for our next uh, SCAG night, so the Scout Cubs and uh, Guides uh, night. Uh, at the Briars, and uh, that's eight o'clock. We don't have any bookings yet, and uh, that will also depend on whatever the uh, COVID restrictions are at um, at that time. Uh, about a week later, on the second of March, we have a school night down at uh, Camp Aluka, or the old um, Girl Guides uh, Camp Aluka retreat uh, in Shoreham, and uh, that's on a Tuesday. And we do need help uh, with telescopes for that one. We're expecting about seventy-five. Um, year five level uh, pupils there on uh, on camp. Uh, on the 5th of March we have our March uh, public stargazing night at the Briars and that's already booked out to our maximum COVID capacity of uh, 50. On the 17th of March is the next uh, society meeting for um, uh, the society at the Briars. Now looking further afield at this stage the geology expedition on Sunday the 21st of March for members is still going ahead at uh, Point Leo though of course anything is possible uh, depending on what uh, restrictions may be announced between then and now but as things stand at this stage that will be capped at about 50 and further details of that will come out uh, closer to the date. And uh, we had a March viewing night originally booked for Parkdale Secondary, but uh, due to COVID uncertainty, they've uh, asked for it to be moved out to uh, 18th of May, which uh, we've now done, which is also a Tuesday. So it's been moved to 18th of May and not uh, in March uh, any longer. And that's still for about 170 uh, year uh, seven students as we uh, usually do there. And also since we last met, uh, we're having uh, another year 10 work experience student at the Briars, and I'm currently going through the process of uh, formalising that uh, with them. And uh, this uh, looks like something that may become uh, reasonably regular, depending on if there's a uh, demand out there and of course uh, dependent on uh, availability. Well, for this evening's talk, we have um, uh, featuring John Dobson, the late John Dobson. Uh, we were lucky enough to have him visit the society way back in the mid to late uh, 1990s and stayed at one of our members, uh, Tony Hale's house in Frankston for about uh, a week. So we, uh, we got to see him uh, uh, sort of uh, up close and personal during that time. Um, and indeed, Tony Hales had his own large uh, Dobsonian telescope that he would bring along to uh, school nights at that time. Now, the, where he actually stayed no longer exists. It's where Bunnings Car Park uh, is today, as all the houses in that area were actually levelled and flattened for uh, the development of uh, that part of uh, the shopping centre in Frankston. Now, John Dobson was born in 1915, actually in Beijing, in China. And uh, his grandfather was a missionary, his mother was a musician, and his father was actually a zoologist, so had uh, quite a uh, varied background. He did a master's in chemistry uh, at the University of California in Berkeley um, in the uh, early days uh, during World War II, 1941. Then after completing that, he spent 23 years as a uh, monk in a monastery in San Francisco. And one of the tasks that um, he was given was to try and uh, reconcile uh, astronomy with uh, the teachings of that particular order. So um, that's how he got uh, his love of uh, astronomy and uh, building very, very simple uh, uh, telescopes. Uh, he then became an amateur astronomer and um, co-founded the San Francisco Sidewalk Astronomers in the USA. So 
the Americans refer to um, what he would do of taking his telescopes out onto uh, uh, onto public arenas as being sidewalk astronomy, to use the American term. And uh, certainly it's um, uh, reflected uh, elsewhere around the world, but not necessarily via that, uh, that term. So, for example, we would use uh, public viewing nights or public stargazing nights, uh, for example. And it didn't necessarily mean it had to be done on a sidewalk or a footpath, but uh, it could also be done in, uh, in parks and uh, other venues, as we've done uh, many times over the years. Now, he was a bit uh, controversial in the sense that he didn't actually believe in the Big Bang, and he was very much uh, a proponent of the Hoyle steady-state theory whereby um, uh, he felt that uh, a more plausible explanation was the, the continual creation of matter as uh, the universe uh, expanded uh, indefinitely. He uh, passed away um, over six years ago now, at, at the ripe old age of 98, but as you'll see from this uh, video, his um, invention of the Dobsonian telescope most definitely lives on. Out yonder there was this huge world which exists independently of us human beings and which stands before us like a great eternal riddle, at least partially accessible to our inspection and thinking. The contemplation of this world beckoned like a liberation. It is because there is this huge world out there, this vast universe out there, that we want to make telescopes. We want to see the universe with our own eyes through the telescopes, not just to see pictures with, of it. And so we're, not, so we're going to make telescopes, but we're not going to make those ship's captain spy glasses with a lens out in front. We're going to make te much bigger telescopes with the mirrors in the back end, a reflector telescopes, so that we can see the universe actually quite well through these bigger telescopes. The telescope that we're going to make is like this. It's open at the front. The light comes down through the front opening, down through the barrel or between the struts like this, to a mirror at the back end. I'll show you the mirror. I'll open the back end. It's a very slightly concave mirror, a very slightly curved mirror, so that it will form a picture at the front end. The light from the mirror comes forward through our barrel or through the struts to a diagonal mirror, a secondary mirror up here at the front, where it's reflected up through the eyepiece tube into uh, forms an image just below the eyepiece and we examine the image with the eyepiece. What you can see through a telescope depends primarily upon the size of the telescope. Through smaller telescopes like 4 inch in diameter or 6 inch in diameter, they're very good for terrestrial use and they're very good for the moon and so forth. But for planets and things you need a bigger telescope like a 10 inch or a 12 inch, which are still very good in the cities. Uh, but if you want to see galaxies and things, what we call deep sky objects, if you want to see the whole universe from a mountaintop, you need a much bigger telescope, like a 16 or an 18 incher. Right now we want to make a 16 incher. It's like having an eyeball about 8 feet in diameter with the pupil of the eye open to 16 inches. But you don't need to make yourself such a big telescope. You can make a smaller one and you'll see as we go along people will be making 10 inchers and so forth. I think most people are familiar with the fact that a lens like this will focus light. You can get an image there, you see. Now what we call the focal length is the distance between the image and the glass. Now a mirror, a concave mirror, will similarly focus light because the light hitting the curved surface will converge forward like this. And again, in the case of a concave mirror, the focal length is the distance between the image and the glass. The major process in making these telescopes is to prepare the surface of the glass for our mirror. It's the same process for any size telescope, only more work for the larger ones. So what we're going to do is to grind a curve into the surface of this by grinding it against another glass like this with carborundum and water in between. And that's how we generate the focal length of our mirror. Then after we get it to the right depth so that the focal length is where we want it, then we're going to clean the curve up with finer and finer carborundums, finer and finer grits of carborundum until it's a very smooth curve. And then what we need to do is to polish it, not on a buffing wheel, but on a polishing lap like this, what we call a pitch lap, 
We're going to pour warm pitch on the glass, cut it up into squares like this, squeeze the, the curve of our glass onto the curve of the pitch. So the curve of the pitch is the same as the curve of our mirror glass. And then since pitch is a yielding substance, the, cerium, the polishing agent, the cerium oxide, will become embedded in the pitch and plane the surface of the glass as we polish. You see this lighter colored stuff down these grooves, that's the cerium oxide, the polishing agent. And when the mirror is all polished like that, then what we have to do is to correct the curve. If the mirror is a little bit too flat in the middle, we have to polish it a little bit more like that. And when the maximum defect on the curve is less than one one thousandth of the thickness of a saran wrap, we're ready to have it illuminized like this and put a decal on the middle to line up our optics, help us line up our optics. The next major task is to build the body of the telescope in which the mirror will be mounted and then to put it in a rocker so that it can be aimed anywhere above the horizon. We want to be able to push it wherever we want it to aim and have it stay wherever we leave it. Now where do we get the materials to make a telescope like this? One thing you can do is to try the ads in the magazines like telescope, astronomy, te Sky and Telescope magazine or Astronomy magazine and if you can't find suitable ads in there to find what you need to get, you can try your local astronomy club. There's almost surely somebody in the local astronomy club who can tell you where to get what you need. Now we're about to make a 16-incher, and I have an old porthole glass, which is one inch thick at the edge and 16 and a half inches across. Uh, portholes are hard to get, but any uh, thick round glass can be used. So we're going to drive some furring nails into the bench here so that the uh, mirror can, so the tool glass can turn around like this but won't slide. You can drive them in with the uh, glass all right. This is not very tender glass. Before we actually start to grind, we want to pick up the back end of the bench so that the mud from the grinding won't run into our laps runs into your lap, mommy won't like that. So then we have to put some water on here and then I think I'll grab the other side and then we, we usually we squeeze the water out but in this case we don't need to do that and then we have to sprinkle it with carborundum, 60 grit carborundum, like about four times salted scrambled eggs. Now this makes quite a bit of noise but right now it won't make very much because of all that pitch on there but the pitch will grind off very quickly. When we grind like this, and there's rough grinding to generate a curve, we have the mirror off to the side, the center of the mirror off to the side of the tool glass, so that the middle of the mirror glass grinds away the edges of the tool glass, and that generates a convex curve on the tool and a concave curve on the mirror. Now in this case, we're starting with an already used tool. If we had started with a flat tool, we'd have grinding pits all over the surface of this one. But since we've started with a curved tool already, at the beginning we don't have good contact. So for the very beginning, it looks a little slow. But by and by, it won't look so slow, and we don't have to grind anything off the edge because we've, not, we've we started with a, with a curve, and we just watch this curve come out to the edge. But for generating a curve, we keep the mirror on the top and keep it turning around all the time and keep the middle of the top one against the edges of the bottom one, towards the edges of the bottom one. We don't hang it too far over. Carborundum grinds fastest under pressure. So since this is a solid piece of glass, it behaves as if all the pressure is at the middle, and I put my hands down in such a way that the pressure of my hands is on the line across the middle. I don't put my hands out here or back here or over here or over here. I want the pressure to behave as if it's at the middle so that the middle grinds away faster, or the middle of the top glass grinds away faster against the edges of the bottom one. Well, that's quiet enough. We should clean it up. There's not much use going on because the pits that the grits make are too small. And so we clean it up and do it again. What we're trying to do 
is to grind a concave curve in the top one, a little deeper than the thickness of a nickel probably. Now when you sprinkle the carb around them, you see you make longer strokes when you are across the middle and uh, shorter when you get to the ends. Now you notice that I have my sleeves rolled up. If you have your sleeves all the way down, you see you may get grits in them and then when you go to do fine grinding, you got the grits carried over into your fine grinding. Up in Sacramento, there was a little boy who used to wipe his hands on his pants. He used to run his hands through his hair and he used to wipe his hands under his armpits. And he was sparkly all over. And I made him go and change his clothes and take a shower between each two kinds of grits. So you have to be care about, careful about things like that. You have to be careful how you put the mirror on and take it off. You can put it on like this if you want. I don't care if it breaks the edge of the tool. But you must not put it on like this so that the edge of the mirror gets scraped. We don't want any uh, glass off the edge of the mirror. So you can put it on like this and take it off like this, but be careful that you don't touch the edge of the mirror to the tool. So off we go again. Ouch. Now you see the mirror turns around a lot. The mirror keeps turning around, but the tool doesn't have to turn very often because diseases of the tool are not contagious to the mirror because the mirror is turning all the time on the tool, even if the tool has a big chip out of it, don't make no, never mind. From the time we put carborundum on to grind, till the time we put carborundum on a second time to grind, is called one wet, and we've done two wets so far, and you can see that this much of the curve has already been ground out, as we continue, the, the size of the curve that's been ground out will spread out farther and farther out towards the edge. Uh, if we had started with a flat tool, we'd have had these rough pits all over the surface and we couldn't have seen this so nicely. But we started with a curved tool and so you can watch the curve gradually go out to the edge. Now what we do is to check to see that the curve gets to the edge just when it gets to the proper depth. If it gets to the proper depth too soon, before the curve gets out to the edge, we'll put the mirror on the bottom and the tool on the top. But if it gets to the edge before it gets deep enough, then we'll hang over farther to the sides. Now this is called rough grinding and it's a caveman's job. You eat well, sleep well, and work like hell. All right. Now, uh, how many hours have we been grinding all together? All together with the rough grinding? Yeah, rough grinding is all we've done. About nine and a half. Nine and a half hours. So at this point, we've been grinding for over nine hours. We've measured the focal length once, and it's between five and six feet, which is a good deal shorter than the eight feet we're aiming for. Now, we, uh, when we first ground, we ground with the tool on the bottom and hang it with the mirror hanging over. I'll put that down. I'll show. Let's end up, please. We ground this way with the mirror hanging over the edge like that so that the middle of the mirror grinds out against the edges of the tool and then when we did, we did that till we got the focal length down to five or six feet but that's way too short so then we turned it over if you just pick that up so then we turned it over and put the mirror on its back and so with the tool on the top you see we can grind over here and get the, the, we had the curve in here and all this was flat, flat glass. In order to grind the shoulder, we turned, put this on its, on its face up and put the tool over here. So the middle of the tool grinds the shoulder away like that and like this. So that we've done for two hours or so now and the curve's out to a quarter of an inch from the edge. Now we have to test the focal length. If you'll just toss this thing on the floor, I'll put some on the lawn, I should say. I'll put some water on it and we'll test the focal length. Okay. Still a little nervous about yeah. testing it. To measure the focal length of the mirror, we want to catch a reflection from this curve. But since the glass is all rough, we pour water over it and catch the reflection from the water curve. Oh, we're way out, aren't we? How we're way too far. Can you measure that? That's nine feet, huh? Nine and a half feet. Nine and a oh, half feet. Dear. What does that mean at nine and a half feet? It means we gotta turn it other side up again. Turn it up. We gotta turn it, put the tool down again. Yeah. We've got the focal length too long now. By pushing the curve out to the edge, we got the focal length too long. Now we're shortened again by putting the tool on the bottom. Okay.
with the mirror on top, you see, it's easy to keep it turning all the time. That's real easy. When the mirror was on the bottom and the tool was on the top, it's easy to turn the tool, but you have to remember that the mirror is on the bottom. So we had to keep turning and turning and turning the mirror all the time. That's to say, when the mirror is on the bottom, you still have to turn it. When the tool is on the bottom, you only have to turn it once in a while. The tool doesn't matter much. As I so often say, diseases of the tool are not contagious to the mirror for the simple reason that they're turning with respect to each other all the time. You've got to set it down on the floor and see if you can find this. All right, just hold it there. All right, it's about there. Now, if you can give me the end of the tape, or give her the other end, whichever. Good? It's about eight feet, three inches. All right. Eight feet, three inches. All right, now what I suspect is that we have more than one curve on this mirror. Just hold it up so I can see the reflection of the sky. No, just hold it up, please. Hold it up level, please, so I can see the reflection of the sky. Hold it way up here, please. Yes, I think the curve isn't all the way out to the new curve. See, we had this old curve out to here. Now we got a new curve inside of it, but it's not all the way out to here. Do you follow me? Okay. When we did the original grinding with the tool on the bottom, right. we ground a curve, a steep curve, in the middle, okay? But it didn't come out to the edge. You remember, it took, day, it took hours and hours to push the curve out towards the edge. And we only got it somewhere out here or something, two inches from the edge. Then we turned it over with the mirror on the bottom. Right. And then with the mirror on the bottom, we pushed the curve way out near the edge. You see? Mm -hmm. All we have to take out is the shoulders. So I don't think we have very much more to do. I think half an hour might will probably do us. Hang on. That's about there. What is it, eight feet? Oh, it's eight, just one inch shy of eight feet. Or just oh, shy of eight feet. eight feet? Okay, shy good. Eight feet. Good, 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 good. Well, what does that mean now? We keep doing what we've been doing. This feels good, and uh, the curve seems to be, well, it's about an eighth of an inch from the edge. And uh, since we just tested our focal length and it's, uh, uh, it's about eight feet, I think we should clean it all up and go on with 80 grit. 80 grit is still fairly rough grit. You can take that bucket away, I'll throw these things down and hose the place down. Okay, so it's got to be real clean. Yes, yeah, so and we'll move to another part of the lawn. Okay. This is all 60 grit part of the lawn, we'll move to a, another part for 80 grit. Okay. We have to be careful in the cleanup between these sets of grits so that we don't carry over any of the rough grits into the finer grinds. Otherwise, we'll have rough pits all the way through. Outside first, all the outside first. Around the neck, see we got all these grooves, get it all down. All out first. All right, now you squirt it up into the bucket. This is a brand new towel. I mean, it's a brand new cloth that we're going to use for a towel. We can't use the 60 grit one anymore. Now, it's very easy to carry grits over to a finer, to a finer session. And you have to be very careful about it. Have to keep your sleeves rolled up when you're grinding. See, I wouldn't grind with these sleeves down here because they'll carry the grits over. I'll take the jacket off before I start to grind again. Now, look at this, you see. You can see that there's a, there's a slightly different curve. You see that big bubble in there? You see that big bubble? That means we've got two curves in our glass still. But I think we can get it out all right with 80 because it's not very bad. But you see, the center of the, of the, center of the mirror about that much has a slightly different curve from the rest of it. If it were very different, then this thing wouldn't stick all over like it does. Anyway, let's start grinding 80 grit. This won't make quite so much noise as the 60 grit made, but it's still fairly rough grit. And it'll still behave very much like that. Yes, I gotta take off my jacket. There, that's our focal length. Just 
Just write it AC. A feet, fine. AC. Right Neato. Okay. Now let me put a little bit more water on it. And if you'll take this paper, I'll see if I can see anything amiss in the curve. Yeah, hold it. Yeah. Uh, I think it looks good. I think it looks good. I think it looks good. And how close to the edge are we? We're to a sixteenth of an inch. We're out to the edge there. We're not more than a sixteenth anywhere. And a hundred grit will get us out there. That's fine. So we've roughed out our mirror curve with 60 and 80 grit carborundum. Now we've gone on and fine ground it with 100, 240 and 400 grits. Some of the kits that you buy for making mirrors may have many kinds of grits or many uh, state, uh, grades of grits like 12 or 14 grades. That introduces the difficulty that you have to clean up between that many more grades and that takes extra time. So we use about eight uh, wets with each grit and we use a smaller number of grits. You might want to see what these grits look like. So I'll pour some out. This is uh, 400 and we'll pour it out here so you can see it. And uh, then this is 80 grit. It's a very much coarser uh, particle, much larger sized particles. Uh, after each uh, grit, we clean up the mirror. After each grade of grit, we clean up the mirror, and dry it, and then hold it up to a bright light like this to check and see if there are any larger pits over the field of finer pits which we've just put in. Say, after 240, we look to see if there are any 100 grit pits still showing. If there are, then we go on with 240 before we go on. Now we've finished with 400. We're ready to check for pits and see if we're ready to go on for 1000, which will be our last grit. You want the single bright light behind you, behind the glass, and your eye close to the front of the glass, and you look for sparkles that are bigger than the background sparkles. But in 400, there shouldn't be any background sparkles big enough for you to see. Through the last grits of fine grinding, 400 on, we have used warm water between the glasses to bend the faces of the glasses away from each other so the mirror won't grind away too much at the edge. Now when you first put this on, it'll be on those little hills, you see, and it won't, uh, won't slither around. But as soon as I squash down the hills, see, as soon as the hills all get squashed down, then I'm on a water layer, see? The water layer is thicker than the grit layer, uh, okay? Uh, the water layer is thicker than the grit layer. So you have to grind for a while like this until the water gradually leaks out at the edge. Then you get down to where the grits are touching the glass. But even for quite a while, it'll do that. Mm -hmm. If you dance this tool around like this, the chances are that the curves will stay sufficiently uh, the same, sufficiently meshed, so that we won't have a sticking problem. If it really gets stuck, you can pound them apart as I do, or you can uh, soak them in warm water. As I said, you can put it in a bathtub of warm water and they'll separate by themselves. And that's a slow way, but uh, uh, usually if they're going to stick, they'll warn you. Just as you go towards center, it'll, it'll tend to stick and you'll know that it's going to stick and then you can back off, don't fight it. If it gets sticky as you're going towards center, don't push it on over, back it off. And then put in fresh grits and take short fast strokes to make the curves nearly the same. In the preparation of the telescope mirror there are four stages, the rough grinding and the fine grinding we have done. We're ready now to go on to the next uh, two stages, which are uh, the polishing of the mirror and the final correction. You remember that for the polishing of the mirror, we need a pitch slap like this. Uh, the pitch slap we're going to use will be bigger than this, but we're going to uh, show you the pouring of the pitch slap for a class of students making 8 and 10 inch telescopes. But uh, we're ready now to heat the pitch. It has to be soft like cold honey before we pour it on the glass. Uh, two of these, I'm sure, would do for a, for a ten-incher. But the problem is, what are you going to heat it in, you see? 
if a lot of the stuff's going to be left in your container, uh, so you can't heat them in the cardboard, if you have to heat them in something like this, and you're going to lose a lot in the, in the can, then you have to allow for that. But I do a whole lot of pitch laps for a class, you see, so I don't exactly worry about that problem, but probably two of these will do it for a for a six inch for an eight incher. That's say for an eight inch lap. Now that's all I have to do. Then we leave them on very low fires like that for a couple of hours. After it's heated for a while, you see you've got some liquid on the bottom. And if you move it like this, you can get the hot liquid to come up to the surface and push this colder stuff down to the bottom so you don't run into the problem of heating some of the stuff too much. If you heat the stuff too much, then you run into the difficulty that it loses its, its uh, ability to yield under pressure. See, here the liquid comes right at the top when we push this other stuff down into it. Now, I need somebody to get me a little bit of toilet paper from the girls' room or the boys' room. Just a few sheets, lay like half a dozen sheets, that's all I need. Now what you have to do is to put a little water on that. I'll show you first time how much. Now that's probably too much. And then we want that wet over the whole surface. Okay. See what's happening up there? You're gonna want that wet over the whole surface, but we don't want a lot we don't want a lot of cerium oxide. That's the right amount of cerium oxide. I have to put turpentine on the tool glass. There's water and cerium oxide on the mirror glass, so the pitch will not stick. We'll have turpentine on the tool glass, so it will stick. And unfortunately, they get turpentine on my fingers, too, which is a pain. All right, now we're going to pour, OK? Don't chew it, OK? <laughs> oh, I need water. Water, water. It's staying hot, and it's just keep on keeping on flowing. Stick. The stick for grooving the pitch lap needs to be wettable, and like unfinished wood, so that it can be soaking wet, so it won't stick to the pitch. This should be reheated. You see how thick this lap is? The pitch is real thick. And so it doesn't cool off fast, you see? Now, if I pour a pitch lap with pitch that's pretty cool, then it comes out real thick, and your pitch lap is real thick. If I pour it with pitch that's too hot, the pitch lap will be very thin. Now, you might think that the hot pitch will stay hot longer, but it won't. <laughs> the hot pitch will be so thin, it'll cool right off into the glass, and then it gets it very hard to groove. So it's much better if the pitch is not too hot. OK, take it away. Don't use your thumbs on it. Just let gravity do its thing. Go ahead, put it here. Where's your tool? Turn up. Everything's clean?
Now this is a little bit warmer this time, so we won't have quite so much trouble. Though. See if you can scrape this all off of here. See if you can scrape it all off of there. I don't care whether you use knives, forks, anything. When I poured this pitch lap, I didn't see what the problem Oops. was. But watching the film, mm. I easily see what the problem was. The pitch was too hot. And if the pitch is too hot, one layer cools off in the face of the mirror, and one layer cools off in the face of the, of the tool, and the pitch in between those two layers is still warm, and it splits there when you pull the tool off the glass. Still, still took off the top side. It's okay, we can manage this. No, we can't. Can you take it off again, please? No, 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 it still took off the top surface. For polishing the mirror, we need some substance like pitch that has the ability to embed the polishing agent and yet will yield under slow pressure to conform to the curve of the mirror. And we groove the pitch lap like this, waffle it if you like, so that over the entire curve it can keep the curve of the mirror. It can yield under pressure. Okay, take it away. Whose is it? Thank you. Don't push it though, just let it rest like that. Is that the end? All right. Your mirrors in the present state are what we call wet pressed, okay? Now let's just suppose you were able to go right ahead and polish. Then you go right ahead and polish. If you have to go out and buy beer or pet food, which is the most bought things at the grocery store, beer and pet food, leave it wet pressed. But if you have to sleep overnight or go for a ski trip over the weekend or something like that, don't leave them wet pressed. They'll dry together and you won't get them apart. So don't leave them wet pressed over long periods. So right now, you've got cerium oxide and water between your mirror face and your pitch lap surface. So they won't stick. But if you have to go for a long time, you take them apart, leave the pitch lap by itself, immediately dry up your mirror with a clean, soft, expendable rag. Then when the pitch lap is dry all the way down into the streets, then squeegee the dust off your, pitch, off your mirror face and set it down very carefully, center over center, but don't slide it. Just set it down center over center. And that's called dry pressed. We have a general rule. The mirror and the pitch lap are married till the aluminizer doth them part. Okay? Now don't handle the mirror faces with your fingers or your thumbs. Don't do that. Keep your hands off except when you're squeegeeing them or something like that. Don't handle the glass like that. Uh, fingerprints, the glass is soluble in fingerprints. You might not think so, but it is. The glass is soluble in fingerprints. You don't want finger grease on your mirror face. Not only that, but if there's, if there's grease on it when it goes to the aluminizer, we don't guarantee to clearing it off. All right, now let me tell you people again what I told you early on, that in this class there is no boo-boo that can be followed by a life of sorrow. There is nothing that we can do in this class that's wrong that we can't get out of. If you drop your mirror and break it, you were supposed to do it the first day. If you've waited till now, you're just a fool, okay? You're, but even that you can get out of. There's another piece of glass somewhere in this world with your name on it, okay? So even if you drop your mirror and break it, and that's boo-boo number one, we can get out of it. So there's nothing that you can do going the wrong way in this class that will be followed by a life of sorrow. In polishing, the cerium oxide gets embedded in the pitch, gets embedded in the pitch and planes the surface of the glass like this. Grinding, we rolled over the grits. Now we're going to plane the surface of the glass and it pushes a lot harder. But the harder it pushes, the better it goes, the faster it goes. But if it pushes too hard so you can't push it, then it doesn't go very fast. So you can push down on it to make it go hard if you have to. But there are no more wets. In grinding, we kept taking it off and putting on more grits 
Now we don't have to do that. The cerium oxide that does the polishing is the cerium oxide embedded in the pitch and in contact with the glass. If you put on too much cerium oxide in water, it serves as a lubricant. So don't do that. You want just a small amount of cerium oxide embedded in the pitch and enough water to keep it wet. Now in polishing, you must not let the pitch lap hand over like that. In grinding, it does, don't make no, never mind because if it hangs over, nothing gets dented. But if I leave this hanging over like that, the edge of the mirror will put a dent in the pitch lap. And um, then if so the squares beyond that will be too high, and when they come over the mirror, they'll, they'll uh, groove it. So you have to be careful about things like that. And you have to be careful when you put warm water on the middle of this to put, uh, suppose we wanted to, you're getting a little dry. You don't pour the warm water like that. You put a little cerium oxide like this, and then you put a little warm water on your fingers like this, and smear it around real quick, so as not to have a puddle of warm water in the middle. A puddle of warm water in the middle will raise the temperature of the glass there, and raise the surface. Then when you polish, you'll polish that part too much, and you'll make a little lake there in the glass. This is the hard job. You mustn't let it do its turning on its own hooks. You've got to see to it that you have the same amount of polishing for the same amount of turning. It was the same as in fine grinding. We had to do the same amount of grinding for the same amount of turning. And here we have to do the same amount of polishing for the same amount of turning. Now with only a little bit of polishing on here, we can test the focal length. And once we know the focal length from the polished curve, not from the water curve that we measured before, once we know the focal length from the curve of the glass itself, with a slight polish on it, we can go on building the telescope, because then we'll know how long a tube to, to get, and so forth. So we'll know the dimensions of our telescope as soon as we measure the focal length of the slightly polished glass. There are two convenient ways of measuring the focal length of our mirror. Uh, one is with the sun, as you saw before. We have the sunlight coming in like this, and hits the face of the mirror and focuses in here like this to an image of the sun. Now, uh, in the absence of the sun, we can do this in another way. Just consider that the, that the mirror is part of a very large sphere, you see, like a Christmas ornament, all shiny inside. And this is the center of that sphere. The light from, say, a candle here going to any part of the sphere would come back to the candle. Now that gives us another way of measuring our focal length, sort of indirectly. What we do is to take a, a flashlight in here, shooting at the mirror, and catch the image of that flashlight a little bit off sides like this, and go back and forth like this until the image of the flashlight on the paper is sharp. That means we're at the center of curvature of our large sphere, which is approximately twice the focal length of our mirror. So since the focal length of our mirror is about eight feet, we'll start our measurement out at about uh, twice that. Okay, so we'll just guess at 16 feet here. Three, six, nine, Somewhere around here will be 16 feet. And uh, we'll see if the flashlight gets into our eyes back here. And now you see the center of, it focuses about here. So uh, we'll, we'll catch the reflection on, on here. See if we can find it. See, it focuses way back here. And so we'll bring this back. And then the focus will come up. We'll bring this back a little more. The focus will come up again. Now we're off by just a, about an inch, maybe. Bring this back an inch and this forward an inch. A little more. There, now you see the, 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 the bulb there, the focus of the bulb and the, and the actual bulb are at the same distance from the mirror. So we'll measure the distance between this image of the bulb and the bulb itself. We'll measure the distance from there to the mirror. <coughs> Three feet. Six, 
six feet. I had 15, so that's 16 feet, two inches. 16 feet, two inches, so the focal length will be half that, that's eight foot, one inch. We were shooting for eight feet, and we got eight foot, one inch, that's very good. The advantage of having it uh, kind of in between like that is that you get enough power without having it too hard to manage. If the focal length is too long, the telescope is too hard to manage. If the focal length is too short, it's too hard to get high enough power. So we're right where we want it to be. Well, now that we've measured the focal length and we know that the focal length is eight foot one inch, we can order the tube, build the whole telescope so that we can read the curve. Uh, our problem now is to build the whole telescope so we can read the curve and to polish the mirror more. It's just a little bit polished and it's hazy at the edge. Now, lots of mirrors don't polish at the edge. Ours polished fairly well at the edge because we used warm water earlier on and uh, just for that purpose to get it to polish at the edge and it does polish some at the edge. But some mirrors don't polish at the edge and lots of mirrors that end up with turned down edges, that is to say the curve is too low at the edge, lots of mirrors that wind up like that aren't polished well at the edge. And the problem was really introduced in fine grinding. If you use the warm water and you're very careful taking the thing off that you don't run it over the edge, then very often the mirrors will polish at the edge. It matters, of course, whether the mirror polishes at the edge. Uh, if, you, uh, if you consider how much light you add when you put one inch around the edge, it's quite a piece of light that you're adding to your mirror. If you put one inch in the middle, it doesn't matter very much, but one inch added to the edge is a great deal of glass. After we've been checking the focal length or anything, before we start polishing again, we always squeegee the dust off the mirror face like this. You can't uh, assume that because you've been drying it with a cloth, it doesn't have any lint on it, but your hands can feel all sorts of fine stuff. So you squeegee it with a dry hand before you put on cerium oxide and water to polish again. We'll have something like four more hours to polish, maybe. We might get it done in less than four hours, if we're lucky. Depends on how hard it pushes and how much we eat. If you're very vigorous in polishing, polish very hard, it polishes pretty fast. Now you're very careful putting it down like this so that you don't bang the pitch against the glass. Now if by accident you bang the pitch against the glass and broke a little piece off, and I did break a little piece off the edge here, you have to be sure that it does not get between your pitch lap and your mirror. Because if a little bit of pitch gets between your pitch lap and your mirror, it will get embedded in one of the squares of your pitch lap. And that raises that square a little bit, and every time that square crosses your mirror, you get a new groove. So you have to be very careful that nothing gets stuck in the pitch lap. Okay. It only takes about a quarter of a teaspoon of cerium oxide, probably, to polish a 24-incher. Though we usually use more. This is the job that I wish were easier. Now, if these, the commercial people, they don't polish these, these things by hand. They have a machine to do all this. It's getting a little dry. Now, when it gets dry, you just take it off. Put a tiny bit of cerium oxide in the middle. And a little bit of water. And smear the water around real fast so as not to introduce a temperature problem all in one place. Keep the water warm. And then put it down very carefully. Here's our catalog. 18 inch tube, one piece at seven and a half feet. 
Since polishing a mirror like this usually takes several hours, if you don't want to do it all in one stretch, you can take time out and go and buy the tube. Usually the tubes are available at your local uh, concrete accessories uh, outlet or you can consult your local contractor. Now, do you have any use for this little piece you cut off? No, you can take it off here. Thank you. Seven and a half feet, right? Yeah, seven and a half feet. Now that we know our focal length and now that we've bought the tube, we're ready to build the rest of the telescope and it's going to look something like this. This is my old 18-incher called the little one. And on these larger ones, that's from 16 inches up, we have a box that goes all the way down to the end and then we have a tailgate like that. And we'll show you the inside in a little while. But smaller telescopes like 12 inches and in down, we don't run the box all the way to the back end. We just put a tailgate in the back end of the cardboard tube. Once we have the mirror all done and mounted in this uh, box around the tube and all, whether it's this size or this side, we have to be able to aim the telescope above the horizon, anywhere above the horizon, so we have to swing the telescope in a rocker. So this is the rocker. These boards are called the side boards. This is called the front board. This is called the bottom board. And then this one that sits on the ground is called the ground board. This one sits on three feet. It's a, tri it's a tripod. And then this thing swivels around on top of the ground board. And then this goes up and down like this in the cradle boards. These are called cradle boards. Inside the side boards are the cradle boards that cradle the telescope like that. We'll make the box around the tube out of three quarter inch plywood so that when we nail into the edges of it, the plywood won't split so easily. And we'll have it three feet long so that it's about one third of the focal length of our mirror. And the inside width of the box has to be a little bit more than the outside diameter of our, of our cardboard tube so that we can put some Teflon down the sides of the box so the tube will slide in and, e in and out easily. Now we can set up. We've cut the six boards for the rocker. We're now going to build the rocker. Put one up in the work table. Now this is our top side. Yeah, this is our top side. So we're, this is 20, this is 20 and a half. And we've got to add cradle boards. That gets us up to 22. We're going to allow a half inch for clearance. So there's 22 and a half inches. This 22 and a half inches is the inside width of the rocker box. We've allowed for the width of the box around the tube, the outside width of the box around the tube, and the thickness of the cradle boards on either side, and we've allowed for a little clearance. All right, now we lay this down like this. For our smaller telescopes, we make the rockers out of three quarter inch plywood, but for bigger telescopes like this with a longer focal length, we make the rockers out of heavier stuff. This one will be one and an eighth inch flooring plywood. And to prevent flexure in the ground board, we'll double it. Right side up. I'd like to see what it looks like with the box inside it. We ought to see how much clearance we're going to have. So we're going to put the cradle boards in here and jam the box up against them and see how much clearance we got on the other side. Should be about half an inch. This is going to be a tripod, you see. This is what we call the ground board. It's going to be the other side up. So it takes three feet, one at each of these front corners. This is front, and one in the middle of the back side. So it sits on three feet. So it's a tripod. It's only this tall, but it's a tripod all the same. Now, the lower bearing is going to be this computer disk moving on three pads of Teflon. The three pads of Teflon will be fastened to the ground board, and this will be fastened on here. And the, the Teflon pads are going to be something like this, on, but they'll be on the ground board. So this thing is going to spin around on these three pieces of Teflon fastened to the ground board. So first we have to fasten this thing 
with some little tacks so that it won't fall down when we turn it over on that. We want this thing fastened, this computer disk fastened to this and the Teflon facing up so that our bearing surface doesn't get dirty. See, this is going to be upside down. So this surface is going to face downward and it won't get dirty. If we put our bearing the other side up with this up, then dirt would get on here and get into our bearing. But the Teflon goes on the ground board and the, the surface that runs on the Teflon goes on the bottom of the box. This is the bottom of the box. For smaller telescopes, like 8 inches, we use phonograph records, or phonograph records. But for these larger ones, if we can get computer disks, we prefer these computer disks. These are very hard, slick surfaces, and they're 14 inches in diameter. So they make very good bearing surfaces. For finding out where we want the Teflon on here, we're going to use this for a, for a circle. We're not centering this circle on the center of the board. We're centering it over the triangle which is made by the three feet we want underneath out in the board. that direction, out in that direction, and out in this direction. This is one foot over here and two feet over there. So our, that disc is 14 inches, so we can put these Teflon pieces out here on the outside edge of this thing in something like an equilateral triangle. Let's just get it looking pretty much like an equilateral triangle. And then two little tacks on each one will fix it. And the heads have to be driven down into the Teflon. Ready? Ready. Wait, no, no, no. I'm going to turn this around. This goes this way. The front is that side. Yeah, it's going to be something like there. Now hang on, let me see if I can get this screw through the both holes. Yeah, all right. We're in both holes. Okay, then the screw, do you have a washer on it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so. Hmm. Still not quite snug. Now you're too tight. There, good. Now feel it. Wow, that's beautiful. That is really smooth. You might think that a big thick piece of glass like this wouldn't bend, and that's why they made it big thick like this, so that it wouldn't bend. But we're only allowed to bend about one one thousandth of the thickness of a saran wrap. And for that reason, we still have to be careful. And that's why these things are supported with three points on the back for the smaller ones, nine points for the bigger ones. Uh, what we have on the back of these uh, tailgates is three adjustment balls for positioning the, uh, for ad adjusting the position of the uh, mirror so that it looks straight out the front end of the tube. Now, on the, on the uh, inside of the tailgate, we have uh, these pieces of masonite on this floppy piece of cardboard so that in case the telescope is dropped on the floor, the bolts won't break the glass. Now on the bigger telescopes, where the mirror is quite a bit larger and maybe not so thick as these, we have to have a nine-point suspension on the tailgate. So each of these adjustment bolts pushes into a triangle which has three pressure points that, f that uh, push into the mirror. You have three triangles, one here, one here, and one here, so that each of these three tailgate bolts pushes into three points on the mirror, so you have nine points of pressure on the mirror to spread the uh, uh, support system out so as to keep the big mirrors from bending. As I said, they're allowed to bend about one one-thousandth of the thickness of a saran wrap over their entire width. So now what we have to do is to find the center of this board because the, the mirror, uh, the support mechanism, has to be centered on the tailgate. So first we'll just find out where the intersection of these two diagonals is and then we'll construct, yeah. Then we'll construct the, um, hang on, hang on. I can't see that side. All right, go ahead. 
Then we'll construct the um, uh, tailgate. Which is eight? This is eight. This is eight. All right. Now, let me get that uh, that that envelope with that uh, tailgate picture in it. Now, this picture I drew to half scale. That is to say, eight inches on this picture will be sixteen inches on the diagram. So. We just have to measure them on here and find out what we want. So what we want now is the distance out to the bolts. So that's going to be five inches. This is two and a half inches on the picture. So five inches. So that's where our bolts go on that circle. Now... We want them tight fit so that uh, at the star party, people won't come up behind and wind them up with their fingers. We don't want them loose enough so that they can be wound up with their fingers. The cardboard has to be thin enough so that it won't change the pressure on, these, uh, on the points on the triangles. It's just to keep the triangles from turning around this way and getting their points out of position. But it's not to keep the triangles from doing this freely. That gets glued down here to the middle, you see. And then we put our triangle, glue our triangles, our wooden triangles over here. Whee! All right, now what we usually do is to cut these corners back a little bit. But uh, probably we don't need to bother with that because our mirror is going to be way out beyond that. So these are going to go on like that, you see. This is better for tech. This is this is plenty good. Back. Now you see, we don't have to get these things exactly positioned because what we're going to position is the points on here, see? There we go. Now we're ready for the bib. How about the blocks for the strap? We have to put the blocks in also for the strap. Uh, okay. All right, I think that should do us. Now we can cut the bib. Between the blocks is almost 16 and 3 quarters inches. We only need to have the mirror slip in here between them. And this will center the mirror back and forth this way over the tailgate. That's where we want it centered. And uh, it will slip in between here. And then we put something over the top to keep the mirror from rolling down forward through the tube. All right, we're now going to uh, put the tailgate together. We've got to, put the hin got to have it hinged to this uh, 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 tube box. And we've already built the support system here. But we, we have to mount the mirror in here. We're going to put straps on here. We have to mount the mirror in here in such a way that it sits right over the middle of the support system. So we have to transfer the middle of the support system to the front of our bib. So we're, we're finding the, the, the uh, diagonals. This is how we found the center of the support system, by, by drawing the line between the intersection of the diagonal. So we're doing the same thing here. So this is the center of our support system. And the center of the mirror has to be over that. When the strap is around here, you see, we're going to have this strap fastened here on these blocks so that when we slide the mirror down in there and, it, and the edges of the mirror run into that belt, the center of the mirror should be over the center of the support system. All right, so now we're going to put the hinges on. We've already put the hinges on the, on the edge of the tailgate, but, and we've taped this so the bib won't fall off while we're working on these things this side up. And so now we have to fasten the, uh, have to screw the hinges to the box itself. Thank you. 
You remind me of my friend in Sacramento. By the time he finished building something, it was about, the weight was about half nails and half wood. <laughs> Now I think the thing to do is to put this thing up on these things so that we can open the back end, put the mirror in, put the strap on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put a hasp on here, you see, so that when the mirror is in there, we keep this thing turned like that so the mirror can't come out. That's the thing, when we don't have the screws in, we still have to have a safety uh, thing up here. So we put this thing right over the center. So we can fasten one end of the strap in here first, you see, before we get the mirror, and then pull it up to the right place and fasten the other end over here, and we'll cut the extra off. Had we left room for it, it would be better to have the strap come around the outside edges of the block. Otherwise, there is a danger that the strap itself may bend the mirror. Unfortunately, you see with all these scratches on the back from going round and round on the bench, we can see where the middle is without having to mark it. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Now, if the screws didn't have such real wide washery heads, we'd have to uh, put a washer in there to hold it so we don't hang on the screw. You see, the weight of the strap can't hang on the screw. It has to hang on the friction between the screw head and the wood. It has to push the belt down like this. It's the friction that keeps it from coming off like this. There we go. Now what we don't have yet is anything to keep the mirror from falling forward. So that we have to do now. There has to be something that protrudes across this thing, like a piece of masonite or something, that keeps the mirror from falling forward. Now you see, if these things are in this position so that we could get the mirror in easy, then this thing runs into the tailgate and it won't shut. So in that position, you can close the tailgate, but the mirror can't roll out. These blocks are to keep the, the uh, tube from running all the way through. I'll show you. We'll just push this piece of tube through there, you see. We have to have something to keep it from going too far down. We're putting these Teflon strips in here that, so that when you slide the tube down into the box, it slides down on these four strips of Teflon so the friction is easy. We want it so that it slides in and out easily but stays tight. Okay, we got our four Teflon strips so the tube will slide in here. Now we got to peel the inside of the tube out. Now, you, you see, you get a hold of this little tip here, you see, and then you just peel. And that's a plastic layer. And sometimes it'll peel all the way out from one end like this, but not always. And if it breaks, you may have to send a kid in to fix it. If there's a little tear in it, you see it tears right across. Mm -hmm. This is a fun... Far enough that we can reach from the other end. Oh, easy. <laughs> easy. Well, what we're going to do now is to cut some, some slices out of these so that they'll fit inside the big tube. We want one piece where the big tube comes in near the tailgate where it's going to be pushing up against the lid, against the roof of this box. We don't want the tube to buckle there, so we're going to have it reinforced with that. And the other reinforcement is where it hangs out over the edge here. So we want two pieces of reinforcing inside that tube to make a double wall at the back end where it comes in here and at the front end where it comes out here. So the problem now is how much do we cut out of this? So this, this wall, let me have the yo-yo or a ruler. The wall is about a quarter of an inch thick, almost exactly a quarter of an inch thick, maybe a tiny bit more than a quarter of an inch thick. And so when we put this one inside of that, we're going to decrease the diameter by half an inch. 
So if you decrease the diameter by half an inch, you decrease the circumference by pi times a half an inch. So it's going to be a tiny bit more than an inch and a half that we have to cut out of this. OK, let's try it. Let's see, is this the, yeah, this is the end we cut out. OK. Is it in? Mm -hmm. Oh, how easy. Yeah, it has to go a little farther in. All right, that's far enough in. All right, in you go. Hang on. Till it bumps, till it bumps, till it bumps. I think you've bumped. For a focusing device, we're going to be sliding this brass tubing in and out of this cardboard thing. And this is going to be glued down to here, you see. And we're going to stick this from inside the tube out like that and glue it in inside or screw it in inside. And so this will be, our, our eyepiece will be in here. And then we'll focus by sliding that in and out of there. But since that's a little bit tight, I'm going to peel out a layer of paper from inside there. If they're too tight, we peel a little out. If they're too loose, we glue a little piece in. Yeah, that's just right. Okay. So now this gets glued down onto here and has to set up. Now you might think that just putting the glue on there would be sufficient, but it's usually not sufficient. We usually scrape it in so that the cardboard gets wet with the glue before we put it down there. Because if you don't get the cardboard wet with the glue, your glue joint may not hold. All right, that just has to set up. Our problem now is to mount the diagonal mirror in the middle of the, of the, of the telescope tube so that the light can be reflected from the diagonal into the eyepiece. So we're going to have this block in here like this with the diagonal mirror on here. So the light's going to come from the main mirror, reflect from there into the eyepiece tube over here at the side. So the problem is how to hold this thing out in the middle of the tube. That we're going to do by having three shingles sticking out of it like this, and we'll cut them off where they intersect the walls of the tube. We're not going to glue this thing in here because the way these things go to pieces is to have somebody with ice cream on his hands or her hands reach in here and pull this thing out. And then the shingles get broken. Now, if you've had them glued in there and they've been broken off, you're in big trouble in the, in the, at the Star Party site. But if they're just pressed in here and glued against the wall, it's a simple matter to take a nail or something, get the little piece of shingle out, and put another shingle in. Anyway, so this will just fit in here like this. And we'll pound it in tight. So you just go in there till it's tight. And then cut it off with the pin snips. Slightly concave. You just twist the tin snips as you cut. Can you see that this is slightly concave? So that when we push it into this block, it'll butt at the two ends and won't rock over like that. If we cut it uh, the other way, you see, then it would not be rigidly positioned. So then we jam this one in here. Our tube is 18 inches inside diameter. We've got to cut these shingles so that it just fit inside. So we've got to measure 9 inches out here, 9 inches out there, 9 inches out there, and cut these shingles off and then bevel the corners. So we'll mark a little place where they, approximately where these two line, these three lines intersect. 
and uh, then measure out there. Nine inches. So we just put a little mark on the top of the shingle there. All right. Now we cut those things off at that point. All right. Now we're going to cut these uh, corners off so that when we slide the thing back and forth in the tube for adjusting the position of the diagonal, it won't split these shingles. So we're just going to cut these corners off like this. What we're going to do now is to glue three little pieces of leather down on here and then glue the mirror down on the three pieces of leather and then we'll prop it up against the wall like this while the glue sets up. Leather is lintless. That is to say, if you use cardboard, it might peel off in layers. That's one of the things that it might do and drop your diagonal mirror down. Uh, leather doesn't make a lot of lint. <laughs> so I like to use leather. So first we'll put some glue down on three places. And then we'll put the leather down. We want to get the leather wet, so, so we'll smear it around a little bit like that. And put our mirror down. The problem with these is the same as the problem with the objective mirror. It's got to be mounted on three points in the back, not more than three. You might think that that's too thick to bend. But we're allowed to bend it only one one thousandth of the thickness of a saran wrap. That's our tolerance. So we have to keep it from bending. So we mount it on three little pieces of leather like this. Now this is a pretty fancy diagonal mirror. Not everybody gets a diagonal mirror that's so fancy as this. We know the focal length of the mirror. It's eight foot one inch. So what we want to do is to find out where we want the eyepiece hole so that the image plane comes just a little ways outside the tube so that we can examine it with our, uh, with our eyepiece. This is going to be inside the tube, but the focal plane, we want to come very close to this, and so this will be sticking out of the tube by an inch and a half or so. So we're going to measure down through the tube here to where the focal length would be. And then from that position, we're going to have to come back by this distance here which is from the middle of the tube out to where the image plane is going to be. From the middle of the tube to the edge of the tube is going to be 9 inches, but we want it to stick out about 2 inches further, so that's 11 inches. So we have to go back from our focal length measurement by 11 inches to where we put in the diagonal mirror, and that's to where we put in the, the, the eyepiece tube. We're going to put the eyepiece tube on this side, so the eyepiece tube comes out this way, so that you can grab the front end with your right hand while you're aiming it around the sky like this, grab the front end with the right hand and, and push the thing around when you're uh, scanning the moon or whatever you're scanning. That's right. All right, stop please now. Stop please now, take it out please. We want to do a little bit of that from inside. If that machine will do it from inside, that's fine, but we want it cut from the inside too, so that when it gets all the way through, it doesn't tear the cardboard for us. The faster you do it, the better it works, because that works as a chisel. You want to do it with a little pressure, but fast. Okay, you're through already. You can do it from the top a little bit more, if you will. Without any pressure down, tip it towards you, tip it towards you. Okay, <laughs> neato, neato. Okay. We've put the diagonal mirror onto the spider mount. Now we push it in here. 
till I can look down the eyepiece tube into the diagonal and see the objective straight down in front of me. That means the diagonal is in the right place. Then we use the tailgate bolts uh, 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 for positioning the mirror so that it looks straight at the eyepiece hole. Anyway, the, the diagonal is in, we can put the mirror in, and then we've, we can find the center of gravity, and then we can hang it up and use it. Well, we, we want to set the telescope up now so that we can read the curve. So we're outside now, we get to find the center of gravity of this thing. So we've got it over a roller to where it balances, you see. So I'll mark a little place here on this, where the ruler is on this side, and a place on the other side where the roller sticks out on the other side, and then we'll average those two positions 24 and a half inches on this side, and it's 25 inches on this side. So 24 and three quarters inches is the um, uh, center of gravity. 24 and three quarters inches from the from the tailgate is the center of gravity. See, 24 and three quarters puts our top end well. We have to be a little higher than that anyway, you see, because the distance that we have to clear is over to this corner. It's not just down to here. It's not 24 and 3 quarters. Will you hold that on the mark? So it's about 26 and a half. 26 and a half. So it's more nearly 26 and a half. So we'll be just, yeah, we'll be just clear of the top of this. Yeah. So it came out nicely. So we can put in the... Uh, we can put in the side bearings. We now have to put the cradle boards in here, but they have to be far enough away from the front wall so the box won't run into the front wall. So the box, halfway, half the width of the box is going to be 10 and a quarter inches. So we'll put this, the middle of this, 10 and a half inches from the front wall. How's that? 10 and a half inches from the front wall. So he centers the center, the center of the cradle board this way and I center the altitude. But put your screws in first from your side. Okay, now you have to tell me how far, how far forward and backward it has to go. And I'll do the altitude. I got my marks on. Okay, you need to go that way. How far? Three quarters. <laughs> All right, now let's see if it'll swing, okay? Okay, ready? yep. Wait a while, wait a while till I get underneath it. Okay. Is it on our Teflon? Mm -hmm. I think it's on our Teflon. Yes. This thing doesn't hold up here. Right, that's, we need the screws. Let me see how it moves now. That's fine. That's good movement. See, we want it to push on the diagonal. When we push it on the diagonal, we want it to go on the diagonal. That you feels want fine. Any more freely than that, no, this is just right. Up. And see, it, it, it goes just a little bit past horizontal. Mm -hmm. Okay? Actually, these big ones never have to go down to the horizon, so it doesn't have to do that. All right, we're ready to read. We're ready to read the mirror. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to screw this thing up in order to read the mirror. Mm -hmm. When we're putting the mirror in and have the tailgate open and all, we just use this hasp for closing it up. But when the telescope is in use, we're going to have it screwed in in the four corners into those four blocks so that it's rigid. You want the thing to behave like one piece of stuff. Now that suddenly makes it possible to line up the tailgate, the mirror with the tailgate bolts, which otherwise it was not possible to do. Now, if you have a wrench, I'll tell you how to line it up. What we want to do now is to line up the optics, you see. We want the diagonal mirror to be right down in front of this tube, which means it has to go a tiny bit forward All right, and then we have to have it so that looking down this tube, we see the center of the mirror straight ahead.
Right. What we're doing now is looking into the eyepiece tube at the reflection of the diagonal in the objective mirror. Now, in order to get the, the diagonal proper, properly positioned, we want it to see the, the center of the objective straight down. So when we've got it approximately lined up, then we move this back bar. And if I move the back bar up, the image of the a mirror moves up. If I move it down, the image of the mirror moves down. If I move it in, the mirror image moves in. And if I move it out, the image moves out. And so that's how we do our fine adjustment. It goes the way we want it to go. We'll do it in fine detail when the mirror's back from the illuminizer, but just for reading it now, we're doing it kind of crudely. So we've got the diagonal lined up. Now we have to line up the objective mirror. So you see it's too wide on this side. Can you see that? It's too wide over here. You have to tighten your bolt a little, a little tiny bit. Tighten the top of hair. Half as much as you did that one. Okay, that's good. I'm ready to read the mirror. I'm ready to read the curve on the mirror. What we're doing now is reading the curve of the mirror. So what we do is to get the glint of sunlight on one of those insulators in focus at the eyepiece, and we'll show you that. And then we throw the eyepiece out of focus on either side, a little bit too far in and a little bit too far out, and we examine the distribution of light on those two out of focus discs. If the mirror happens to be too deep in the middle, the center light will bundle too soon, so we'll see the center of the disc too bright when we push the eyepiece in. If the center of the mirror is too flat, the center light will bundle too far out, and we'll see the center of the outside disc too bright. Any portion of the mirror that bundles too much light beyond focus is too flat. Any part that bundles too much light on the inside disc is too deep. So what we'll do, you see, we'll get one of those little bright spots in focus, and then we'll pull the eyepiece out, and we'll push the eyepiece in, and we'll see what the two discs look like, and then we'll assess the damage. When we read the, the mirror in uh, Ken's backyard, the mirror was a little bit too high in the middle, and we wanted to take out, we wanted to polish the middle a little bit without risking touching the rest of the mirror. And so I just happened to have an eight inch pitch lap, which we put in the, uh, in hot water, very little by gradually so as not to crack the pitch, and heated it up very, very slowly until it gets hot enough so that you can dent the uh, pitch with your fingernail very easily. And then we pressed it on here until each of the squares comes down to this curve, not to the curve that was originally poured for, but for this curve. And then we can polish the center of this mirror with this lap. Now, if you didn't happen to have a smaller lap and you wanted a smaller lap, you can always cut off the edges of your old lap. But the difficulty is then you don't have the big lap to smooth it with afterwards. But we still have the big lap if we want to smooth afterwards. But the problem is to dig out the middle with, with this little lap without risking wrecking the edge of the mirror. So that's why we like to do it this way. See, the 10 inches we do on 8 inch laps for the same reason. We do them on 8 inch grinding tools and on 8 inch pitch laps so that we don't have to risk rest wrecking the edge when we dig out the middle. Most of the curves come out with too high a middle after you've been polishing. So mostly you have to dig out the middle a little bit like this, and if you have a smaller lap, that's the easy way to do it. I polished the center of the 16-incher with the 8-inch lap till the 16-incher was warm in the middle. Then we read it in the telescope tube. It was still too high in the middle, so we went in back and polished it till it was warm again. We had to do it several times before the out-of-focus discs looked the same on both sides of focus. When they do, your mirror is ready for the illuminizer. Most people, of course, don't bring their mirrors down to the illuminizer like we did. They look at the magazines to find out where to send them. We have, in this case, so soaked the mirror in acid and then cleaned it up with water. And now we're cleaning it with methanol before it goes into the vacuum chamber to get the aluminum coat on. Oy!
Okay, now it's on. Now it's on. Now we'll check to see if that'll rotate in there. And there it's spinning around. And now we're ready to put the vacuum on. See, this is the fun part of making telescopes, getting the mirror illuminated. That's the fun part. You've done all your hard work, now you get to see something. <laughs> It doesn't look too hazy, does it? But it's not as bright as... Yeah. Oh, it looks better than I thought it would. Oh. Anyway, we need to put a decal on it. We put a decal at the measured center of the mirror to help in lining up the optics. We line up the diagonal mirror struts till the decal appears to be straight down the axis of the eyepiece tube. Only after the diagonal is lined up like this with the decal do we glue it to the sides of the tube. Mission accomplished. Now that we've done all this hard work, it's time to assemble the telescope for a star party so people can see what the rest of the universe looks like. Okay, you guys, the moon. You better salvage that. And are you going to get the mirror, the 16 inch it's in? Right here. Oh, it's in? No, John. Oh, oh, you have it. Oh, my gosh. My golly. That is incredible. That is just beautiful. Yeah. When we were reading the mirror, we lined up the diagonal rather crudely. Now with the decal on the illuminized mirror, we can line it up carefully. Okay, here it goes. Run this down. Now that we've lined up the diagonal so that the decal is seen straight down the axis of the eyepiece tube, we're ready to adjust the tailgate bolts till the objective is looking straight back at the eye. All right, uh, loosen mine a hair. Stop. Okay, I think we're in business. Now let's get the moon. This has never seen anything, except a power pole. <laughs> the only thing this has ever seen is an insulator. <laughs> Oh, this is a fabulous show. All right, everybody come and have a look. Wow. <laughs> now you see what we did. As Einstein said, out yonder there was this huge world, the contemplation of which beckoned like a liberation. But sometimes people ask me, what is beyond this huge world? And I ask them, what is beyond the space when you dream? The dream is in the dreamer. The dream is in the dreamer, and the dream is alive. Hi all, welcome.
welcome back to Groundhog Day Sky for the Month for the month of February 2021. Only a handful of highlights for the next month or so. Uh, basically starting off with uh, full moon occurring on the 27th uh, of this month. So we've got a little bit of uh, dark sky ahead of us for the next uh, week or so. Uh, Comet uh, Atlas is about half a degree north of Sigma uh, Octans. Now for those not sure, Octans is in the vicinity, uh, or the South Celestial Pole is actually in Octans. So uh, if you find south, you might have a chance of finding that comet. Uh, the moon is at perigee, which means it's at its closest approach to Earth, so not that it's overly noticeable, but it should appear a little bit bigger. Mercury at descending node, unfortunately, isn't between us and the Sun uh, at the moment, so we don't get a, a Mercury transit. Uh, a very rare event uh, in any case, mainly because uh, there's a lot of things that need to line up. The Vesta, uh, one of the larger uh, asteroids, is at opposition, and that's one worth noting because uh, it actually has a magnitude of around about 5.8, uh, and so it should be uh, perhaps a little easier to find than some of the other ones at around magnitude 10 and 11. Uh, 6th of the 3rd, we had the last quarter moon, so the sky started to get a little bit darker again. Uh, on the 6th of the 3rd, we also had Mercury at its greatest elongation west. Being elongation west, it means it's a morning object, but is uh, a fair way from the sun, so not a bad time to actually observe it. Uh, Neptune is in conjunction, so not that you really see much with Neptune, but uh, you certainly won't see anything with Neptune around the 10th of the 3rd, and probably beyond for a little while. The new moon occurs on the 13th of the 3rd, and uh, you'll notice down the bottom next month, we have a new comet, uh, Pons Winicky, which will be about 0.3 degrees northwest of Kappa Opiuchi, or Opiuchus for those who speak normal English. The February sky, uh, looking to the south, uh, has a few interesting uh, objects in it, which are certainly uh, good objects for the uh, particularly newer astronomers to have a go at uh, getting. Uh, earlier I mentioned the new comet Pons Winicky uh, appearing in octanes. Now if you look uh, towards the bottom uh, centre of this picture, you will see the South Celestial Pole, and just below that is octanes. Uh, that's basically where you need to look uh, to see uh, or to hopefully find this comet. Uh, two rather impressive uh, globular clusters uh, becoming more visible uh, with 47 Tacane to the right of Octans and you've got Omega Centauri uh, over there in, in the Centaur to the left of the South Celestial Pole. Uh, additional objects worth having a look at, uh, your Southern Pleiades, your dual box cluster there at the bottom uh, of Crux, a reasonably easy one uh, to find. You've got the Eta Carina uh, Nebula, just a little bit above the Southern Cross there. And over in the large Magellanic cloud you still have the Tarantula Nebula, which is uh, impressive in, uh, uh, when you take a picture of it. Not sure you'll really see much through a telescope itself. Uh, up to the right, you'll notice the ghost of Jupiter. Uh, this is a planetary nebula. It is uh, the remnants of a dying sun that uh, shed its outer layer. Uh, and it has the uh, basic appearance of uh, Jupiter, but just a little bit fainter. Looking to the north, we have a, a few objects. Uh, one thing worth noting there is the uh, relative proximity to the northern uh, horizon of the ecliptic plane. Uh, this is due to the Earth's current uh, tilt. Objects, uh, M44, 67 and 35 there, uh, near to the ecliptic plane, uh, open clusters, uh, certainly uh, definite targets for 
for uh, newer telescope users. Uh, over there in Taurus, you'll notice both the Pleiades and the High Aids. And uh, they're also open clusters, although uh, I think they do have a Messier number, but uh, not on this chart. My Messier number, uh, it is a number that was put into or given to these objects by a gentleman named Messier, I think in the 1800s, who uh, went about cataloguing a lot of the objects that uh, were visible in the sky but weren't, or clearly weren't, uh, stars. So, uh, hazy, fuzzy patches, etc. Uh, M42, Orion Nebula, uh, obviously it was visible to the naked eye as a bit of a fuzzy patch. Uh, really, until they were able to put telescopes on them, they weren't too sure what they were. What planets are visible this month uh, seem to be determined to have you up uh, early morning uh, at the moment. Mercury uh, moved through its inferior conjunction on the 9th of the 2nd. Uh, it's a fairly quick little uh, planet. Uh, it won't be long before it uh, is actually up in a position to uh, be better seen. Uh, as I said, it becomes a morning object, and from the 20th until the end of February, it will appear between Jupiter and Saturn. So, nice little uh, triplet there for people to, to have a look for. Venus, uh, also a morning uh, object, and uh, on the 6th and 7th, uh, it passed uh, within one degree of Saturn. Uh, and on the 11th, passed within one degree of Jupiter. So we've got a group of planets that are in fairly close uh, proximity to each other. Our uh, Venus has passed its maximum elongation and is uh, slowly uh, getting closer to the Sun as it approaches its superior conjunction. Uh, Earth, not a lot uh, to talk about Earth uh, this month. Uh, it is heading towards the equinox in March, and uh, our southern summer will come to an end. What summer there has been, and only hope autumn brings with it better viewing weather. Although most of the planets are morning objects now, Mars is uh, still visible in the evening, uh, getting closer to evening twilight. Uh, currently in Aries, moving into Taurus, and at the end of February will be fairly close to the Pleiades open star cluster. Jupiter, uh, back in January, passed its conjunction with the Sun, and uh, as a result will move into the morning sky. It uh, will be fairly close to the horizon, so if you wish to see it, you, you'll need a fairly uh, good view uh, out to the east. On the 12th, uh, Jupiter and Venus uh, only about half a degree apart uh, and in Capricorn uh, it shares that constellation also with Mercury, Venus and Saturn. Uh, Saturn becomes a morning object. Uh, it's also passed its conjunction last month. It's uh, very low on the eastern horizon. Uh, probably still invisible in the dawn sky. Uh, it is one of the planets, uh, along with Jupiter and uh, Venus and Mercury, uh, that is in Capricorn this month. Uh, Uranus, still in Aries. You're going to get sick of hearing me say that, but uh, unfortunately it's going to be that case until 2024. It is, however, getting lower on the western horizon, and so it might uh, start to disappear in the evening twilight. And Neptune is, uh, as I said earlier, approaching its conjunction with the Sun, and so it's pretty well lost to the evening sky. If you're really desperate to see it, you're going to have to wait a little while until it becomes a morning object. The appearance of the uh, planets, in as much as you can uh, see them, you will note that uh, Mercury is going to appear very much as a uh, crescent. Uh, given it's not a very big object, uh, it's not going to be a very big crescent. You need a reasonable telescope to see it. Uh, Venus is uh, showing pretty much a full face as it uh, around the other side of the Sun towards us. Uh, it is heading towards its superior conjunction 
and so relatively uh, small uh, and also a morning object. Mars getting further away and if you made a comparison to last month you would note that it has a disc that is getting much smaller and more difficult to see any uh, detail on. Both Saturn and Jupiter are still fairly close together. Uh, they're not as big as they can be. However, uh, both of them are fairly low on the eastern horizon uh, in the morning, and that was due to passing through their uh, conjunction with the Sun uh, last month. Uranus and Neptune, uh, as I said, Neptune probably starting to uh, disappear a little bit as it heads into conjunction with the Sun, and Uranus may very well be getting lost in the evening twilight. As for the other stuff this month, uh, we still have Comet Atlas uh, passing through uh, Triangulum Australis into Apis and then into Octans and uh, finishes about two degrees from the South Celestial Pole. However, the downside is it will be around about 11th magnitude and uh, it is heading out, uh, outbound, so uh, probably last opportunity to see it. However, Comet Pons Winnicky uh, will start to appear uh, in March at around 11th magnitude, brightening to 10th magnitude through March. And it's visible in Ophiuchus, which is uh, a similar vicinity to uh, Scorpio. As for the meteor showers, active from the 31st of the 1st until the 20th of the 2nd is the Alpha Centaurids. Maximum hourly rate of uh, around about 6 from uh, occurring on around the 8th of the 2nd, uh, which I do note has passed. Minor planets that are in opposition this month, uh, for the newer members, opposition means they're in the best uh, position to view them, although if you look at their magnitude you'll note that being around about 9, 10, 11, and uh, even in one case 12, they're not the easiest objects to uh, find, and generally you're probably better off taking a series of uh, astro pictures over a couple of nights and looking for the little one that moves uh, amongst them. Next month, uh, I'll mention it here, even though it's not on this list, is Vesta uh, moving into uh, opposition uh, in early uh, March. And Vesta is a, a slightly bigger object, or asteroid, and uh, it has a magnitude of around about 5.8. So uh, it's certainly one that uh, will be worth looking for. Uh, Pluto in Sagittarius, uh, it's moved past its conjunction in January and so it's become a morning object, but uh, once again, not the most visible object out there. And welcome all to the last installation of uh, Steve O's Solar System Tour. Uh, this one will uh, look at those objects that are out beyond the orbit of Neptune, uh, which currently is the uh, last known planet. We have a, a rather large donut-shaped uh, occupied area that uh, is known as uh, the Kuiper Belt. And it is pronounced Kuiper, I believe. Beyond that, you have the Oort Cloud. And generally, the Oort Cloud is uh, where a lot of our comets originate from. Now, as I said, the Kuiper Belt itself is a, likened to a donut in that it's, uh, it's not very so much a, a disc, but rather a, uh, a donut-like uh, collection of dwarf planets and icy bodies uh, out beyond the orbit of Neptune, which is at uh, 30 astronomical units. The Kuiper Belt extends out to about 55 astronomical units from the Sun, and I remind uh, particularly the newer members that that means it's 55 times the distance uh, from the Sun as what Earth is. You can probably imagine it as uh, similar to an asteroid field uh, out there beyond the orbit and it contains objects such as Pluto and the dates following them, uh, Pluto, Eris, Make, Make, Haumea and quite a few others, those dates were the dates that they were discovered. You can see Pluto was discovered well ahead, which is 
why Pluto is considered the ninth planet for so long. With the discovery of Haumea, Eris, Make Make and a few others uh, in the early 2000s, that was what prompted them to review what it was to be a planet or what it was required to be a, uh, a planet. And they were all demoted to dwarf planets uh, due to that. At the moment, there's over 2,000 catalogued uh, objects out in the Kuiper Belt, and uh, scientists believe there's uh, a lot more. One of the reasons they're not a planet is uh, your Kuiper Belt objects have significantly uh, elliptical orbits, and uh, those who've looked at a picture of the solar system will note that Pluto's uh, orbit actually comes inside uh, that of Neptune uh, for a small part of it. Now that recently passed uh, back in the early 2000s and it's now out further and I doubt any of us will be around for the next time it does that, uh, given it's about 234 years to complete an orbit. Um, the term dwarf planet was adopted in uh, 2006. Uh, it's fairly controversial and there's uh, a lot of uh, push, so there is certain astronomers that are trying to redefine the term planet uh, essentially to something that is round and if uh, that's adopted uh, the solar system planets will increase to about a, a hundred planets. Uh, just an example, Pluto, uh, named for the Roman god of underworld, has a diameter of 2,370 kilometres and is uh, on average 49 astronomical units from the uh, Sun does, however, have an impressive number of moons for a, for a little rock, and that's five. And after the visit by New Horizons, it's believed to be about 70% rock, and interestingly, 30% water ice. Apparently a lot of people, and a few astronomers, were not the only one unhappy with the term dwarf planet. And as a comparison uh, of all the dwarf planets there, you have Pluto and uh, Eris, although I believe with uh, more improved measurements you could probably swap those two around. Pluto is slightly bigger than Eris, however Eris is more dense. Uh, Ceres in the middle there, that's the biggest of the asteroids, uh, in the actual inner asteroid belt if you like, and how many are probably won't get graded as a planet because of its really uh, odd egg shape. And if you look to the uh, left there, you'll see a uh, fainter circular object. That is Mercury in comparison to, uh, to these dwarf planets. And so concludes Sky for the Month for February 2021. He's hoping that uh, next month we'll be back in person, back at the Briars. Once again, tonight's information was provided by Astronomy 2021 uh, by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. Thank you for listening. Mark Stevens, as I said, hopefully see you next month. Goodbye. Hi right, everyone, welcome back to Cody's Lab. So as you can see, we're using the vacuum chamber once again. And I actually have a little feather right there, as you can see, suspended in front of a 12 volt electric fan. See, I got the batteries, a pressure gauge, and everything in there. To turn it on, I have a little tilt switch that is magnetically controlled. 
can see when I turn the fan on, it blows the feather all over the place. This is, of course, at atmospheric pressure right now. So, I want to take this down to Martian conditions. You uh, might have noticed the Martian reference over there. First thing I'm going to do is add a little bit of dry ice to the chamber, just so that uh, the atmosphere gets replaced with CO2. Many of you guys were complaining about that last time. So now I should have a CO2 atmosphere, or at least it'll create one. And now we're going to suck out all of the air, or at least most of it, down to the point for about uh, between four to six millimeters of mercury, which is of course the pressure on the surface of Mars. So let's plug in the vacuum pump. And there we go. Give this a little while to suck down. These pieces of CO2 look really interesting in the vacuum. The gas produced causes them to levitate and float all over the place. But if you can see the gauge over there, you can see that the air pressure is just about to the point where it would be considered the surface of Mars. So since we're at Martian air pressure, let's unplug the vacuum pump and uh, let's turn on this fan. Uh, place your bets as to what's going to happen to this feather. Now the fan's only going to produce maybe 10 miles per hour worth of wind. On the surface of Mars, the fastest recorded wind speed is about 70 miles an hour. But let's say the superstorm in the Martian had wind speeds of 200 miles an hour, 20 times what we have here. To compensate for that, I imagine the feather is about 20 times easier to push over than a spaceship. So let's see what happens. Okay, fan's on. And the feather's not moving. I click zoom in on that. Not even flinching. Let's turn the fan off. Okay, and let's turn it back on. Okay, so there's a little bit of a sway that's caused by the wind that's produced by this fan. But it's not nearly what we had before. It's hardly even noticeable. So there you go. Now, extrapolating from that, you can imagine that even a 200 mile an hour wind on Mars isn't going to do much. Of course, Andy Weir had to figure some way to strand Watney on the surface of the planet, so I'll let him slide on that one. So to finish up this experiment, I'm going to turn this fan back on, just like this. And now I'm going to let the air back in, and let's see what happens as we come back to Earth. Yeah, almost immediately you can see the feathers start shaking around more and more violently. <laughs> Okay, so the air stopped coming into the chamber, so now everything's due to the fan. What I think is interesting is the fan actually sounds different. It doesn't vibrate quite as much. I guess it is designed to run in an atmosphere. So there you go. The air density has a big impact on what wind velocity actually does. Hope you all enjoyed. I'll see you next time.
I am sitting in a hot tub filled to the brim with solid sand. <laughs> this is one of the coolest things ever. If you take a tub of sand like this and then add air in just the right way, it basically becomes a liquefied soup. This is known as a fluidized bed. It's used in industrial applications such as powder coat painting or in grain silos to make sure that the grain flows smoothly to the outlet. With air on, the top surface is nearly frictionless. It's like an air hockey table. And then when you cut off the air, it freezes everything exactly where it's at. So today I'm going to show you how to make a simple version like this yourself, and then because I became curious what it would feel like to be fully immersed in something like this, we made a hot tub size version. As you can see from the 60 year old video from the Royal Institute of Science, this demo isn't exactly new. I've wanted to build one for a long time, but you can find literally no information online on how to make one like that. So I started combing through a bunch of patent drawings for massive industrial size fluid beds, and I noticed that instead of one big inlet, they all had a bunch of small holes to deliver the air. So starting with that in mind, it still took us 25 failed versions before we arrived at this design. As you can see, it's just a bunch of half-inch PVC pipes arranged sort of in a ladder. But the key is to drill two one millimeter holes 90 degrees apart from each other, and then do a bunch of those spaced 25 millimeters apart. Then you glue all the pipes together and just make sure you orient the holes down so that will keep the sand from getting in. And then you just seal off the container with some hot glue. And then fill your container with either fine sand or we found glass beads worked really well. And you could power with a small air compressor like this, or you could just rent a large nitrogen container like this for about 30 bucks and that'll give you 10 minutes of runtime. As usual, I will put a link to all of the parts I used in the build in the video description. So my buddy Ken had an old broken spa in his backyard, which we decided to put to good use. It just stops and you're like locked in place. It's like a weighted blanket on every surface of your body. <laughs> tested and ready in my ongoing quest to be the favorite uncle I decided to surprise my nephews with it But before we get to swimming in sand, let's talk about the science behind a fluidized bed. And we don't click away if you think science is boring. If you're new here, you should know that my approach to science is similar to velociraptor hunting patterns. I try to bring people in with a catchy thumbnail or a cool thing to see, and then when they least expect it...
Admittedly, the analogy breaks down a little at the end, but if you promise to hang with me for the next two minutes, I promise to try and walk the delicate line between trying to make things simple to understand without oversimplifying or being condescending. Fluidization is just when you have enough upward air so that the force of the air pushing on each grain of sand is equal to the downward force of gravity or weight. And when that happens on any individual grain of sand, it hovers in equilibrium like this. You can think of forces acting on an object like a tug of war. And if an object is in equilibrium, that means there's a tie and it doesn't accelerate in either direction, just like in a real tug of war if the sides are even. However, if you add Stone Cold Steve Austin to this side, that will make it totally unbalanced and will start to move this way, which is actually what happens if you accidentally turn the air up too high. And so fluidization occurs in that sweet spot where the sand particles hover in equilibrium, which makes them easy to move around. This is also the reason sometimes you'll see pools pumped with air to cushion the landing for the divers. Now you notice that some stuff floats in the sand and other stuff sinks. This has to do with the buoyancy force, which is a function of the density of the surrounding fluid and the volume of the object itself. Whenever an object exists in a pressure gradient, there are forces from pressure pushing in on all sides, but they push a little bit harder the deeper that you are, which is why it hurts more to be the bottom guy in a dog pile, or it hurts your ears more the deeper you dive in the pool. And this makes sense because the deeper you dive, the more water there is above you pushing down. And if you add up the size and direction of all those arrows, a bunch of stuff cancels out and you're left with one net force pointing upwards. That is the buoyancy force. And if your buoyancy force happens to be greater than your force from gravity, you float. And if your buoyancy force happens to be less than the force from gravity, you sink. Now we usually think of buoyancy with water, but you could think of things like helium balloons being buoyant in our atmosphere. So here's a trick question. Which of these has a higher buoyancy force? It's actually the rubber ball. Buoyancy force has nothing to do with the density of the object, just the volume. So since the rubber ball takes up more space, it has a higher buoyancy force. But you might object, then why does the rubber ball sink and the balloon floats? Remember, it's a tug of war. The rubber ball sinks because the force from gravity on the thick rubber skin and the air inside is bigger than the buoyancy force. But for the balloon, even though it doesn't have as big of a buoyancy force compared to the ball, it still floats up because that buoyancy force is bigger than the weight arrow from the helium and the thin rubber shell. And the helium will keep rising like a ball floating up from deep in a lake, and then it will eventually hang out where the density of the atmosphere is roughly equal to the density of the helium in the balloon, because that's where the tug of war becomes equal. Whew, we made it through. Now back to my nephews. I am a sun sneezer, which is also known as having the photic sneeze reflex, or the autosomal dominant compelling helioophthalmic outburst syndrome, which basically means if I go from a dark area into somewhere that's brightly lit, you know, like looking at the sun, I will sneeze. Wait for it. There you go.
I'm a sun sneezer. But why does this happen? People have known about this effect for at least a few thousand years. Aristotle was probably a sun sneezer because in his book of problems, he asked, why does the sun provoke sneezing? And his answer was, it was the heat from the sun which causes sweating inside your nose. And so you sneeze to get rid of the moisture. But a couple millennia later, Sir Francis Bacon demonstrated that this could not be the case, because when he closed his eyes and turned towards the sun, well, he did not experience that photic sneeze reflex. So his explanation was that it was the eyes watering, and then when some of that moisture got down into the nose, that caused the tickle which makes you sneeze. But even this theory has its problems, because eye watering is a much slower process than the photic sneeze reflex, so it can't be the cause. Before I started researching sun sneezing, I thought that having the photic sneeze reflex must convey some sort of evolutionary advantage onto the people who have it. If you think about it, sneezing is a way of transmitting disease. In your snot, there can be the living bacteria that cause tuberculosis and strep throat, or viruses that cause measles, mumps, rubella, and influenza. So if you're living in a moist, dark cave and you sneeze, or well, your snot lands on the floor or the walls of the cave, and those pathogens can stay alive for hours or even days, increasing the likelihood of spreading that disease to other people who live with you in your cave. Whereas, if you only sneeze when you emerge from the darkness of the cave and into bright sunlight, well then, that mucus will quickly dry out, or because it's exposed to the harmful UV rays of the sun, it will kill all of those pathogens, greatly decreasing the risk of spread of disease. By the 1960s, some studies were revealing the hereditary nature of the photic sneeze reflex. There was a father who would sneeze two times when he entered bright sunlight, and when they tested his baby daughter, who was just four weeks old, moving her from a dark room into full sunlight also caused her to sneeze exactly two times. And by the 1980s, it was clear that this trait was autosomal dominant, meaning that you only needed to inherit one copy of the gene from just one of your parents in order to exhibit the trait. But when studies of the population have been done, only about 18 to 35 percent of people actually have the photic sneeze reflex. So I don't really think this gives a great evolutionary advantage, otherwise everyone would have it. You know, it could just be one of those random mutations that happens over time and sustains itself because it's neither good nor bad, evolutionarily speaking. So it affects roughly one in four people. Can you spot the person with the photic sneeze reflex? Nowadays, it's actually been found that the gene responsible for the photic sneeze reflex is on the second chromosome, and it's a single letter of DNA that's been changed. On my second chromosome, I have a C where non-sun sneezers have a T. And the reason that we know this is that back in 2010, there was a study of about 10,000 people where they went online and they reported whether they were sun sneezers or not, and then their DNA was analyzed, and the groups were compared, and what they found was the thing the sun sneezers had in common was this one particular letter change in their DNA. That, I think, is pretty amazing. Now, it's unclear exactly how this change affects your physiology and makes you more susceptible to sun sneezes, but the best theory at the moment is that it involves the trigeminal nerve, which is the largest cranial nerve. It involves all of the feeling that you have in your face, and as the name implies, it actually has three branches, one of which receives stimuli from your eye, and another which receives stimuli from your nose. So the thought is that this really active stimulation of the optic nerve may cross over into the maxillary branch, causing that little tickle which gets you to sneeze. Photic sneezes are generally pretty harmless, unless you're doing something like flying a fighter jet or performing some sort of delicate surgery. But this methodology can allow us to learn a lot about different heritable traits and diseases, just by studying lots of people and their genotypes. It was 1922. A 24-year-old Molly Masha was very sick. Her teeth were falling out. 
doctors described the teeth that came out as appearing to be moth-eaten. Her, her jaw, her lips, her mouth was described as one big abscess. Doctors were at a loss to explain what was going on. As her joints were swollen and ached, they prescribed aspirin for rheumatism. A dentist who was trying to diagnose the problem found out to his horror that the jawbone was so soft that it would give way simply by pushing on it. He was able to remove it not by any kind of surgery other than reaching in with his fingers and pulling it out. She died September 12, 1922, five years after she had taken a job in a factory that painted luminous dials on clocks using radium. Molly's struggles and those of other women to find justice and the impact that that had on workplace safety in America is history that deserves to be remembered. In 1898, Marie Curie and her husband Pierre submitted a paper announcing the discovery of a new element, radium, which they named after the Latin word for ray. Though not well understood, the Curies knew that the material was dangerous. Pierre said he would not want to be in a room with a kilogram of the stuff because he feared it would blind him. They suffered radiation burns from handling the material without protection. Effects of long-term exposure were, however, not known at all. In 1902, the inventor William J. Hammer, a lab assistant to Thomas Edison, visited the Curies and returned to the U.S. with the curious material, a radium salt that had a slight blue-green glow. Envisioning possible commercial applications, he began experimenting with the substance. He became the first to propose radiation as a treatment for cancer, and in 1903, he and Dr. Willie Meyer successfully shrunk an incurable tumor by exposing it to radiation. He also discovered that the zinc sulfide glowed brightly when combined with radium, and combined with some glue, created a glow-in-the-dark paint. The U.S. Radium Company began using this recipe to create Undark, a glow-in-the-dark paint, in 1917. At the time, the paint was seen as something of a wonder product, primarily for its use in illuminating watches and instrument panels for soldiers who were soon to be sent to fight in the war in Europe during World War I. The United States would eventually send 2.8 million service members overseas, so women took up many of the jobs to contribute to the war effort. Watch dial panning was one of the best jobs available to women at the time, and it was perfect for young girls and girls with small hands. It was skilled, paid well, and according to supervisors, the radium, the radium was in such minute quantities that it was absolutely harmless. To do the detailed work necessary to paint the tiny watch dials, the supervisors encouraged the girls working in their factories to run the brush between their lips to keep the tip sharp, what they called the lip, dip, and paint routine. In fact, radium was widely believed to be beneficial to humans in tiny doses. Radium was infused into all kinds of products, including toothpaste, butter, makeup, water, and even underwear. One ad bragged their radium product could cure asthma, among other ailments, with no medicine, no drugs, just a light, small, comfortable, inexpensive radioactive pad worn on the back by day and over the stomach at night. Newspapers applauded the element, saying it could add a full decade to the human span. Management at the U.S. Radium Company would wear protective gear when they worked with the paint, and sometimes they would refuse to even buy their own product. But they left the women that worked for them in the dark. The factories were full of radioactive dust that would get into the lungs. The women, unaware that the product was dangerous, would sometimes paint their teeth at the end of the day so that when they bit their boyfriends at night, their mouths would glow. Five years after the factory in New Jersey opened, Molly Maggia became the first to die. But doctors weren't sure what had killed her. Other girls were already experiencing symptoms like aching joints, sore backs, and unexplained pain. The issues were especially prominent in their jaws and teeth, where they had had the most exposure. The necrosis in the girls' jaws would become called radium jaw. When women started dying, the companies ramped up a defensive campaign of misinformation to protect themselves from what they called gossip. In the early 1920s, another factory worker named Grace Fryer started looking for the cause of her illness. She became suspicious that it might have had something to do with her job at the radium factory. She was contacted by a specialist named Dr. Frederick Flynn from Columbia University. He and a colleague declared her perfectly healthy. But only later would she learn that Dr. Flynn wasn't a doctor, but a toxicologist working for U.S. Radium. And his colleague was one of the company's vice presidents. In the early 1920s, the company hired a Harvard physiology professor named Cecil Drinker to study the conditions in the factory. Drinker's report was grim. It described a sick workforce exposed to huge amounts of radioactive material who are literally glowing in the dark. Their hair, faces, hands, arms, necks, the dresses, the underclothes, even the corsets of the dial painters were luminous. 
The company threatened to sue Drinker if he published the report, but behind his back submitted an altered report to the Department of Labor that claimed that every girl is in perfect condition. Alice Hamilton, a seasoned reformer and colleague of Drinker, learned of the forged report and immediately told Drinker and his wife. Cecil published the report publicly in response. In the same year, Dr. Harrison Martland helped devise tests that linked the radium to the girls' illnesses and helped to explain what kind of damage the radiation was doing when ingested. Dr. Joseph Neff, one of the dentists who had worked with the ill-fated Molly Magia, had kept part of her jaw and exposed it to dental film, which indicated a huge amount of radiation in the bones. The USRC worked overtime to discredit the work. It was determined much later that radium works somewhat like calcium in that it collects in the bones, but once there, it starts to eat apart the bones from the inside. As, as the bones start to collapse, the joints swell, and the women would literally get shorter, bent with pain. Grace Fryer's spine started to collapse. She required a brace just to sit up. Grace Fryer and four other workers, Quinta McDonald, Albina Loris, Edna Hussman, and Catherine Schaub, decided to sue the company in 1925, but they faced an uphill battle. The USRC denied any wrongdoing or responsibility for the illnesses. The company accused them of trying to palm off the bills for the sicknesses. Arthur Reeder, president of the USRC, spearheaded efforts to bribe scientists and doctors to deny the evidence and spread studies attributing the symptoms to syphilis or a viral infection. It took them two years to find anyone willing to take up the case. They were hampered by requirement that occupational illnesses be reported in two years, as well as the unknown nature of the disease, which made it difficult for the women to find legal recourse. Grace refused to give up, and in 1927 she finally got the help of a young New Jersey attorney named Raymond Barry. The USRC fought to delay the proceedings, hoping that, like so many other girls, Grace and her co-workers would die before the court battle ended. Perhaps the girl's greatest ally was Alice Hamilton, who used her already proven reputation as a workplace reformer to force the issue. She already had a friend in Walter Lippmann, editor of the New York World, asking him to ratchet up media pressure on the public and on the company. When the girls finally appeared in court in January 1928, two of them were bedridden, and none of them could lift their arms to take the oath. All of them literally glowed in the dark from the radiation leaking from their bones. When the judge chose to delay the case until September of 1928 because U.S. radium company witnesses were summering in Europe, Lippmann led the charge in public outrage. He called it a damnable travesty of justice. There's no possible excuse for such a delay. The women are dying. If ever a case called for prompt adjudication, it is the case of five crippled women who are fighting for a few miserable dollars to ease their last days on earth. The court caved and set the date for mid-June. But before the trial was set to resume, a federal judge stepped in and offered to mediate, despite the fact that that judge was a stockholder in the U.S. Radium Corporation. The girls had asked for $25,000 apiece, but they settled for $10,000, or the equivalent of about $140,000 today each, as well as a yearly stipend, and that the company would take up the cost of their medical bills. But in Ottawa, Illinois, girls were still being poisoned in similar factories, and the companies were up to their usual tricks. They insisted that their factories were safe as they used a different type of radium. Catherine Wolf, one of the workers there, recalled that when they heard about the lawsuits in New Jersey, the girls became wild. The chill of fear was so depressing we could scarcely work. They didn't get to court until 1938, and Catherine gave testimony from her deathbed. The girls in Ottawa faced incredible pressure to drop their suit as it threatened some of the few jobs available during the Great Depression. The victims in Ottawa did have one advantage, however, in that Illinois was one of the first states to adopt a workers' compensation law, and were thus able to appeal to the Illinois Industrial Commission, which ruled in their favor in 1938. It's not really clear how many women died of radiation poisoning. There were as many as 4,000 women who worked in these factories, some as young as 14 years old. In 1938, the Food and Drug Administration banned the packaging of products that included radium, and in 1939, the U.S. Supreme Court denied the last appeal and had the women's death certificates changed to reflect the fact that they had died of radiation poisoning. It was one of the first big cases in the United States where an employer was held responsible for the health of their employees, and the lawsuits eventually helped to spur the creation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, whose efforts have drastically reduced the incidence of death, illness, and injury due to workplace conditions, as well as multiple other state laws to protect worker safety. As she fought the company, Grace Fryer said, It's not for myself that I care. I'm thinking of the hundreds of other girls to whom this may serve as an example.
In 2011, the town of Ottawa, Illinois erected a statue as a memorial to the dial painters who sickened and died there, and to dial painters who suffered all over the United States, in recognition of the tremendous perseverance, dedication, and sense of justice the Radium Girls exhibited in their fight. May they rest in peace. Black holes, they're weird. And a recent paper about them seems to me to be the strangest one yet. Black holes might be covered in hair. I'm Diana, you're watching Physics Girl, and it's been a while since I made a YouTube video, so I hope you're ready for me to get excited about space stuff. Let's get started. So. Iconic theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking may have passed away in 2018, but papers he wrote are still coming out after his death. His latest paper, released in October, argues that black holes might be covered in soft hair. What does he mean by that? We're gonna get there by the end of this video, but first we're gonna understand what the heck a black hole is by doing a cool, weird demo that shows us intuitively why you cannot escape a black hole. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, the gravity of any given object is proportional to its density. So if an object is dense enough, then nothing that gets too close can ever escape, no matter what. Nothing, not even light can escape from an ultra dense object, so we would call that a black hole. Also, can we just take a moment to admire this black hole? My incredible animator made this. This isn't stock footage, this is a physics girl black hole, yo. That's all. Now, from the explanation of nothing being able to escape the gravity of a black hole, you might assume that gravity is a pulling force and you'd be in good company. Sir Isaac Newton thought the same thing back in the 1600s. He noticed that when things move, they tend to move straight unless a force acts on them and curves their path, a force like wind or a kick from Sir Isaac Newton. Newton then noticed that gravity also curves the path of things downwards. So he concluded that gravity must be a force. Einstein thought differently. He noticed a thing with an elevator. There was a moment he realized an elevator out in space accelerating up would act the same as gravity here on Earth. Basically, there was a problem with our theory of gravity as a force. So what is gravity then? Well, Einstein wondered, what if gravity isn't a force, but the curved trajectory of a ball flying through the air is actually straight? I'm gonna have to apologize in advance because the demo I'm gonna show you broke my brain just a little bit. Pretend you live near the equator and you start walking east, trying to walk as straight as possible on your initial path. You might think that you'd keep walking parallel to the equator and never hit it, right? Well. Try testing this on a globe. Try it like this. Line up the edge of a piece of paper so it's parallel with a latitude line, and then keep pushing it down straight to simulate your straight path. And it'll actually end up intersecting with the equator. What? In fact, if you draw the latitude line you started on on your paper and then flatten out the paper, that path would look curved as well. So your path actually curves because while you may be walking straight, the earth you're walking on is not flat no matter what any of those videos in the sidebar may tell you. That's what Einstein proposed, that gravity is not a force, but an object curves in a gravitational field for the exact same reason that your straight walking path ain't straight. Gravity is what happens when you're moving straight on a non-flat thing. Only in the case of gravity, that non-flat thing isn't the globe, it's space itself and time. That's right, the fabric of the universe, space-time, is curved by large masses, just like the Earth's surface is curved. So let's bring it back to black holes. See, they're inescapable. As an object gets denser and denser, the stuff moving near it will take curvier and curvier paths. And then when you get to black hole level dense, the path an object takes gets so curved, it'll never ever lead back out of the black hole. And then it's gone, forever, without a trace. Not even a thank you note, rude. Except it's not quite true that an object is completely gone. And that's where the hair comes in. Now, unfortunately, while a big, dense, fuzzy, black space object sounds adorable, Stephen Hawking was only using hair as a metaphor for the stuff that gets left behind when objects fall into a black hole. Why call it hair? Well, imagine everything in space as a bunch of guess who characters. It's easy to tell them apart because they have their own distinguishing features and unique hairstyles. 
Black holes, on the other hand, only have a few distinguishing characteristics. You may be able to guess some of them. Mass, electric charge, and angular momentum. That's how much oomph its spin has. Other than that, they're almost totally nondescript and bald. So, when unique distinguishing objects like star stuff or Matthew McConaughey fall into a black hole, they disappear, leaving behind a slightly more massive but still perfectly bald black hole. Everything unique about those objects is seemingly gone, disappeared, poof, almost as if black holes are sucking personality out of the universe, depriving us of Matthew McConaughey's beautiful locks. But here's the thing. One of the fundamental ideas of quantum mechanics is that information cannot be destroyed. It can be changed into different forms, but it cannot be destroyed. So if black holes really are destroying distinctive information, then they are violating the fundamental laws of physics as we know them. The theory of black holes has a built-in contradiction. It's known as the black hole information paradox. So to try and resolve this paradox, in that 2018 paper, Hawking and his co-authors propose that black holes don't actually destroy the information of distinctive stuff that falls into them, but instead they propose a process where the information sticks around in the universe as photons on the boundary of the black hole, known as its event horizon. Basically, as Matthew McConaughey is falling into the black hole, he's also depositing really low energy particles onto the black hole's event horizon, leaving behind a fuzzy edge of hair on a black hole. The word soft is used to describe the low energy particles to distinguish them from hard particles, which just have more energy. Hence, a theory of black holes with soft hair. Hawking and his collaborators think that these soft hair photons may be where the universe preserves its information from the stuff that falls into a black hole. So the information is not destroyed, it just hangs out there on the edge. And that is roughly how Hawking and his collaborators think that the existence of these soft hairs could solve the information paradox. There's of course a lot of math too, which you are welcome to treat yourself to. It's tax season, you deserve a break. Now just to be clear, these questions are far from answered. Most of the research around black holes is theoretical. Remember, we've never actually even seen a black hole. We've only indirectly observed their existence. But while theories like this, the soft hair theories, could help solve the information paradox, they're not the final say. And that's how science is done in bits and pieces that add to science as we know it and sometimes don't. I think Stephen Hawking would be honored to know that people like you are still wrestling with his theories. I'm honored to be able to help keep his scholarship alive after his passing. So, thanks so much for watching and happy physicsing, even on the real deep stuff.